Be all of those, uh, and Terry, we all have screen share capacity. Is that set up? Yes, okay. should be. Yes, yes, you, you will. Uh, can I do an audio check from my from my presentation just to see if it comes through? Uh, at this point, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> against the rules <laughs> I like this visualization I think this is from LIGO yeah that was from our first discovery mm -hmm. Shane do you work directly with LIGO yeah, I'm I'm in both the LIGO and the Lisa collaborations. You'll hear mostly about Lisa today. So okay, yeah. So I have a, there's about a, a three minute pres, uh, video uh, about LIGO and thinking how it works and all that stuff. So cool. that's cool. An opportunity to visit LIGO when I was in college, but I had like a marching band gig that weekend or something, so I didn't get to go, and I was very sad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> there's a visitor center at the Louisiana site, but they're building a visitor center at the Washington site. So you'll always be able to drop in if you ever pass through. Oh, cool. So. Hi, Carol. I see you're there. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. How's it going, Terry? Hi, Carol. Good to see you. Oh, good to see you. It seems like uh, the last couple of weeks I've seen you at least once a week. Uh, yeah, I know. This uh, <laughs> this uh, Global Star Party is just a perfect way to get together. Yes, I just it love is. this. What did we do before this? I guess we were actually out observing, weren't we? <laughs> Not observing. I was actually taking airplanes to give live lectures. Last one I took was the end of February to Houston. Haven't been out of the house since then. Yeah. Well, hopefully we can all meet in Albuquerque. Yeah. yeah that's, uh, oh, that's Terry, funny. that would be terrific. You're going to tell us about that, right? <laughs> I'll let Carol tell you about that, maybe. Yeah, we'll have just a little bit about that. Well, the, the interesting thing is that by the time that the league meets in Albuquerque, it's possible that uh, we'll be able to travel then. And the exciting thing about Albuquerque is that my daughter and grandchildren live there. Well, another oh, reason wow. to go, David. Oh, it's a big reason to go. <laughs> We'd love to see you there. It's a I'd easier. love to see you there. If, if, the, uh, if the coronavirus thing has finally taken off and left us, you can be, you know, there's a good chance we'll be there. It's a little easier to get to than Las Cruces, so <laughs> that should be good. <laughs> Actually, Mall, Cruces is easier. Too. Cruces is easier for us, but Albuquerque is fine because because our family's there. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I was looking at plane tickets to. Uh, Actually, no, sorry. I was mixing things up. The AAVSO conference last year was in Las Cruces. And I was like, yes, yes. how do I even get there? <laughs> it's so expensive <laughs> to take a flight there. I'm like, no, I can't go. It's too expensive. Well, Molly, what you do is you fly into Tucson and you're in a car and you drive for three and a half hours and then you're there. That didn't sound like fun no. either. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you have that really cool van, Molly? I, I have a, a trailer, um, yeah. but uh, New Mexico is like, a, that's like a 16 hour drive for me. Nothing. <laughs> Thank you, house. It's a 16 hour drive, like, like when I'm not towing. When I'm towing, I have to go slower on the that's uphills true. because yes, my car, do. I don't have a, I have a compact SUV, which can tow my trailer, but uh, going uphills is a little bit of effort for it, so. Yeah. Unless I want to burn all the gas, I got to slow down a little bit. Because <laughs> like, so my, I have a turbo, and the turbo can can handle it if I want to get like eight miles per gallon. <laughs> hey guys, if you're watching this on a separate like uh, Facebook page, uh, share it, share it to your friends and groups, whatever you, that you belong to. We got a bigger audience that way. Besides that, they'll all want to see. They want to see their friend do this. So, I have to say, I was I was pretty tickled to have my my name next to like Scott Robertson, like an astronomical league, uh, like 
executives and stuff like that. I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> we love you, Molly. <laughs> That'd be fun. Like, like all these big names. <laughs> You've done a ton of outreach. You are, you are you're a great ambassador. You are. <laughs> Well, I'm currently finishing building my slides today. <laughs> Definitely not not procrastinating, right? <laughs> I just brought my stuff up because I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to do a couple of things. I better get things ready so yeah. I can bring it up when I'm ready than have to hunt for it. So <laughs> Molly, how far is Albuquerque from you? Oh boy. Um see if i drive there let's see i was looking this up recently because uh, i was gonna go visit some friends down there let's see Maps. albuquerque uh so if i were to drive it is a 16 hour drive it is 16 okay yeah i was for some reason i thought it was closer than that no, it's uh, um, you got to drive all the way across Arizona after driving all the way south through California. So. That's true. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah the West Coast is, is big. Uh, yeah. yeah. Kind of yeah. like driving through Alabama to get to Florida. Yeah. Like it blew my mind when, when I was uh, living in, in Ohio, um, it blew my mind that, that Disney World was only 16 hours away. And I, I made that drive. And I couldn't believe it. And like, like New York and DC were only ten hour drives away. Like, like here on the West Coast, a ten hour drive might get me to the next state. It might not, you know. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, Molly. Yeah. Where did, you, where did you live in Ohio? Um, I lived in uh, in Dayton. Oh. I grew up in Salina. That's okay. That's great, Carl and Molly. Dayton is only about an hour's drive away from Delphos, where the great Leslie Peltier spent his life. Yeah, I. Up his, yep. I couldn't find his grave last time I was up there. Has anybody seen it? <laughs> I know the graveyard, but I couldn't find it. I learned about about Leslie Peltier in my astronomy club out there. Uh, uh, I guess there was some connection or involvement or something like that. The astronomy club out in Dayton has been around for a hundred years. Yeah, um, part of the Miami Valley. Yeah, yeah. I knew yeah. Leslie. He and I were good friends, and I, I just I visited him twice and uh, his lifetime, and uh, he was just a wonderful, wonderful person to talk wow. to. He was so modest. And uh, when I tried to praise him with from Starlight Nights, he's just sitting there looking bored, thought I was going to put him to sleep. And then I said, <laughs> Leslie, I know some a gal who hated Starlight Nights. Boy, did he wake up. He said, tell me all about that. <laughs> <laughs> he just loved jumping up. He loved it. He loved it, but he hated it. <laughs> yeah. I had a friend that took me up to his observatory after he had long passed away and I got to go inside it you know it felt amazing just being inside of that observatory yeah but yeah the uh, Miami Valley Astronomical Society has the Leslie Peltier's merry-go-round that has yeah. been restored mm. and that's that. it, it's kind of it's really cool to sit in that I haven't sat in it in a long time but to sit in there and turn the steering wheel around and have the telescope and the whole building follow you around. Yeah. Really kind of cool. It's a little tiny shed and it's got like a chair in it and a telescope and you can just sit in the chair and go point wherever you want in the sky using this wheel. And like, I never actually got to look through it, but yeah. I looked inside of it one time and it was just like the, like the cleverest little thing. <laughs> yeah. I feel like you're sitting in a driver, uh, you know, driving a car because yeah. you have a steering wheel in front of you. And a little chair, but you sit down almost on the floor. Mm. It's pretty cool. Where is it at? Yeah, it is. It really, really is. And I'm looking at Simon's uh, 
screen right now, or at least a couple of seconds ago, there was a nice little flare activity next to the sun. There it is, off to the uh, left of the sunspot. Looks like yeah. we got a little flare activity now. Yeah, I'm seeing really, oh, yeah. darting in and out right this second. I'm so happy to see the sun coming alive again. Yeah, I, I can see that uh, the the broadcast is streaming on the Astronomical League's uh, Facebook page. Okay, thank you, Scott. You're welcome. Wonderful. Yeah, it should be some solar imaging today as well. <laughs> I, just yeah. white, I just have a white light filter, but uh, I can still get some nice sunspots with it. Some don't get a, a quark or a, an a solar telescope or something, but these things are so expensive. <laughs> Howard, are you there? I'm, I'm here, uh, but I, my video is not working as far as taking a picture of me. It doesn't like the camera that I've got, but I've got the, uh, I've got the uh, sun on the screen. Okay. I mean, I've, I've, got, I've got the sun. Let's just see. I'm going to try this. Okay. As long as you can share it, you should be good. Uh, let me undo the lens covers and I'll see if I can do that. <laughs> Uh, you How may not be able to cool. share it right now because I'm sharing something already. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm not sure quite how to uh, get. There we go. Let's see. I get this down. Okay. Okay. Sounds like we just heard the sound of the Arecibo telescope falling down. Oh, oh. I was going to say, I'm oh, passing oh, darn. David. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, on my computer screen, I do have a, a CAK image, but I'm not sure how to make that so you can see it. Uh, once once uh, uh, Scott's not sharing his screen, then you can okay. screen. Uh, Don't anybody show? Oh, well. We're... Never mind. <laughs> what? Um, one of my questions is about um, uh, Arecibo. So uh, uh, don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's sad. Uh, science, yep. science News showed a video of it going down. I saw that. Oh, that was Amazing. tragic. Yeah, that was impressive. So the, way yeah, this will, like, the way this broadcast right. will will, um, will happen is um, I'll introduce Terry Mann, and then Terry's going to, uh, you know, take over as host, and she'll be introducing each person as we go along. She'll introduce David first, um, uh, you know, for the first talk, and then uh, uh, she's got a whole schedule. How, how, do, how do you uh, see it going there, Terry? Okay, my schedule is starting with David. And then we will go to Carol mm -hmm. to talk about the Astronomical League. Okay. Then got you and Carol uh, talking about the upcoming stuff. Yep. And I have Molly on to talk about imaging. And then Molly and I are going to discuss very quickly the new imaging program. Carl Winning will be up next for the North Central region of the Astronomical League. Speak a little bit about that. We'll take a 10 minute break and Shane will be up. And in between all this, all of our, our solar and um, Shailendra, or Shailendra, I'm sorry, um, we'll be looking at the sun and night sky in very short views. It's kind of sprinkled in between the speakers. Yes. Okay, that's cool. <clears throat> and, and I've got sun and CAK and H alpha. They'll be black and white, but uh, I'll just cover up the lenses. And if you just give me a head up, heads up about a minute before you need it, I'll be good to go. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, we're about two minutes out. Wendy says hello to everybody. Well, hi, everybody. Hi, Wendy. Wendy. Hello, Wendy. Who is everybody? What, this what is group the is this? Astronomical League. 
Oh, well, hi, guys. Have a good time. A special global star party with the league. Uh, we're spending the day on Zoom meetings. <laughs> and it looks like we might be it's able to... Zoom day. It's in August. Oh, good. Oh, the vaccines? Yeah. The league is uh, meeting in Albuquerque in August. Okay. Well, yeah, we may be able to join it. Vaccines are out. Come on, they're done. done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They'll be. Let's hope they're out. <clears throat> And I think we can add to the list of people who have we've lost during the that during coronavirus. We can add the Arecibo telescope. We can blame it on coronavirus. <laughs> yeah. You have to admit, this feels like old home week. Finally, seeing faces we haven't seen in a while. Boy, does it ever! Yeah. <laughs> The other meeting's over, Wendy? Yep. Yeah. Okay, 30 seconds. colliding and merging. Where did this sound come from? A long time ago, in the distant reaches of the universe, two black holes, each about 30 times as massive as our sun, were locked in orbit and spiraling in towards each other. The only visible traces of the spinning cataclysm would have been the way their gravitational fields warped the light of distant stars. Even as they collided and merged, there wasn't a flicker of light to be seen. The real and very violent action in the system was in the form of gravitational waves, ripples in the very fabric of space and time. These waves were constantly draining energy from the black hole orbits, leading to their ultimate collision and merger to form a single black hole. At that instant, the power of the gravitational waves was 50 times greater than that of all the stars in the universe combined. That pulse of gravitational waves, lasting only a fraction of a second, expanded through the universe, passing unimpeded through countless galaxies. About 1.3 billion years later, it reached Earth. Gravitational waves alternately stretch and squeeze space itself, everything they pass through, but the effect is minuscule. Their effect on Earth here has been vastly exaggerated to help visualize something that is otherwise invisible on this scale. To detect them and directly measure their properties, scientists built LIGO, the most sensitive measuring device ever made. LIGO uses a device known as an interferometer to measure the tiny displacements in space. In this simplified representation, a laser beam is sent towards a partially reflecting mirror and split along two paths. The beams travel along the four kilometer arms and reflect back towards the central mirror, which recombines them, directing their light to a detector. As the gravitational waves pass, the distance between the central beam splitter and the end mirror stretches along one arm and compresses along the other. This changes the time it takes the light to travel along the arms. The recombined light waves shift with respect to one another and produce a signal at the detector. Incredibly tiny stretching and squeezing of space can actually be measured directly in this way. How little does space distort to make this signal? Let's zoom into a hydrogen atom until we reach the proton at its core. LIGO is so sensitive that it can measure changes in distance as tiny as a thousandth the diameter of a proton. And this tiny measurement made by LIGO was the final step in a journey that began 1.3 billion years ago in the distant universe when two black holes collided.
Hello everybody, this is Scott Roberts with Explore Scientific and this is a very special Explore Alliance presentation of the Astronomical League Live. Um, I'm joined here with um, uh, Terry Mann, former two-term ter president of the Astronomical League, um, uh, Car Carol Orge, the current president of the Astronomical League. Uh, we have Carl Wenning from uh, uh, NCRAL. Carl, what does that stand for? North Central Region? Yeah, North Central Region of the Astronomical League. The Astronomical League. League. Uh -huh. uh, our keynote speakers, David Levy and Shane Larson. Um, uh, we have astrophotographers here, uh, uh, Molly Wakeling, Simon Tang, and Shailendra Sharma. Um, and I think uh, Howard Skeldson is also with us, so that's great. Um, and, um, you know, I wanted to uh, take a moment just to introduce Terry. If you haven't met Terry, uh, then you probably have not been to many Astronomical League events because she's been at many, many of them for a long time. Uh, she developed a passion for astronomy as a child, uh, begging her mom not to read her regular stories as, as a toddler, but to read her stories of the stars. Okay, so she had, there was a, there was something in her that uh, made her interested in astronomy and, and, uh, and the starry night sky from, maybe from birth, I don't know. Uh, it's, maybe it was a Mozart effect. But um, uh, she, uh, she also started astrophotography quite young as she, at age, I think seven or eight years old, stole, stole her dad's camera so she could take a picture, her own photograph of the moon, okay, which I thought, Wow, okay, so this is somebody determined, you know, because she thought that she would get the beating of her life for doing that, but instead her dad understood and helped her uh, get that film developed and encouraged her and maybe gave her some tips also on how to Im improve the image. So uh, I think she tried to use a flash or something <laughs> to, get the, to get the moon, which is, it's a great story. But um, she has been a lifelong astronomer, her passions, uh, of course, are into astrophotography. Uh, she is very well known for her aurora photography that she does, uh, and um, uh, she's made uh, countless and selfless uh, uh, contributions to the Astronomical League, so it's a real honor to know her. Uh, she's a great friend, and Terry, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you very much, Scott, and thank you for that fantastic introduction. I almost don't recognize that person. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for everybody for being here. And Scott, thank you for broadcasting this. We really appreciate it. And uh, we have a great lineup of people here. So many things that we can see and do. It sounds like Shailendra has clear skies in London, Simon Tang in California, clear skies. Howard Eskelson in uh, Florida, I think has clear skies and so we, we will be looking uh, at very short views in between the talks here. So I am going to go ahead and get started. And I am going to start with um, David. And I have known David Levy forever. I'm sorry, but it, it seems like he is an old friend that um, I have actually sat on the board at ASP with him. Um, and that's really where I was first really introduced to him. And it was such a great honor to be introduced to somebody that had discovered comets, uh, written books, and to find out he was as friendly as anybody, anyone can talk to him. It just kind of amazed me because I, you know, you never know what to expect. And David has just been as friendly and open with all of the knowledge he has. He shares everything and that makes such an impression on all of us. And we held an ALCON, which is an Astronomical League conference in Tucson, and David and Wendy invited us to their home. And we actually got to look at telescopes. And it was so nice to meet Wendy. Wendy is an amazing lady, as friendly as can be. Her and David are a perfect pair, and they made us feel so welcome in their home. And so I know Wendy's there, and I appreciate everything that Wendy did that day to help all of our group. We all had a great time. Um, so that there, I, everybody pretty much knows David, but just know he is as friendly as he seems and as knowledgeable as he seems online. So David, welcome. 
Thank you for joining us, and I will let you take it from here. Well, thank you, Terry, and God bless you. I, I really appreciated that introduction, and I especially appreciated what you said about Wendy. I think it brought us both to tears. And uh, we now remember that night. We remember the meeting. We remember um, Liz Kalis uh, reaching out to us before the meeting to invite me to give a talk. I remember the night out here, and it was just wonderful. Yeah. Well, and uh, I understand that if, assuming that COVID-19 is gone by the summer, that you're going to have a convention in Albuquerque, and Wendy and I can try to make it to that if we can, but we're not sure at the moment. It's a little far out. Anyway, I wanted to talk with you a bit. Excuse me, Mark. <clears throat> Sorry, I want to talk to you a little bit about the wonder of the night sky, which I see every single night. I go out every night, clouds clear, but most of the time there are at least some stars out. And um, I'm still out with my little telescope and you can see it right here. This is Minerva right next to me. And uh, I use that one and I use a lovely telescope I got from Scotty, I'm like so scientific, a 12 inch called Eureka. And then there's Miranda, with which I have found most of my visual comets, all but one. And um, and so I just want to introduce you to those telescopes of mine that are out there. And I love it when I go in to go to bed finally at night. I close the dome. I, I mean, I close the observatory door. And I go in and I often think, you think the telescopes, when I'm gone, just sort of talk among them, amongst themselves, talking about what they saw, what I tried to show through them, and if I knew what I was doing? I really don't know, but I like to imagine that they do, because telescopes, to me, are people, too, and they are precious gifts, and uh, whether I bought them or whether they were given to me, they are precious gifts that I will never forget. <clears throat> It's been a tradition at these global star parties that I usually have a poem. And I certainly have one today. And this one is so off from astronomy that I'm probably going to be expelled from the league after this. The board of the league will get together and vote to expel me just as I was very nearly expelled from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada back in 1967. And uh, Scotty has just admitted that he's caught his telescopes actually talking. <laughs> I hope they were talking in English. Those of you who, um, those of you who might have this book or would like to get it, and if I could give a little ad for it for a second, it's my autobiography, and you can get it from Starzona, www.starzona.com has copies of it. You can get it if you call Dean at Starzona. Uh, he'll actually set it aside and I can autograph it for you. But anyway, so much for the commercial. Anyway, <clears throat> the, po the first poem that I'm going to read from is actually a very ancient American folk song, <clears throat> which has nothing to do with astronomy until a few minutes ago when I realized that one of the women that it refers to is Dinah. Dinah turns out to be the goddess of the moon in many ancient, in many ancient uh, mythologies, and including in our own religion of Judaism. And uh, because there was a penumbral eclipse of the moon last week that some of us might have seen, it brings that to mind. <clears throat> but for other reasons, uh, the song kind of tells the story of, the, of Dinah as told in Genesis chapter 34. But uh, here's the song. You all know it. Feel free to sing along from Facebook and YouTube and everywhere that you're watching this from. And let's have some fun. I've been working on the railroad all the live long day. I've been working on the railroad. Don't talk. Don't laugh too much, Scotty. <laughs> Just to pass the time away. Bum, 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 bum. Can't you hear the whistle blow? And Dinah, won't you blow your horn? 
Can you hear the whistle blow when Dinah blow your horn? Ba -ba -ba -bum. Someone's in the kitchen with Dinah. Someone's in the kitchen, I know. Someone's in the kitchen with Dinah. Strumming on the old banjo and singing fee fi fiddly i o fee fi fiddly i o fee fi fiddly i o strumming on the old banjo. <clears throat> you know, the one thing you love about American folk songs is that they really the song is about nothing. It makes absolutely no sense at all until suddenly it clicks and it does, and it's about the moon. And uh, uh, we're going to have a lot of fun today, and I'm going to end with a more serious quote from John Keats. He wrote this sonnet. I'm just going to read the first three lines of it. In 1819, just two years before his early death from tuberculosis. I love to think if John Keats were alive today, he'd be with us. I think he'd be with us. He'd be with us on Zoom, and he would probably want to read the poem himself. But he can't, so I will. Bright star where I were steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendor hung aloft the night and watching with eternal lids apart. I dedicate that little three lines of the sonnet to the star Sirius, which is what I suspect he was looking at, the brightest star in the sky. And Terry, I'm going to give it back to you now. Let's have a lot of fun today. Thank you very much, David. I really appreciate that. It's good to hear from you again. And we plan on having a whole lot of fun. So next up, I have Carol Orge. Uh, he is the current president of the Astronomical League. Uh, he and his wife, Betty, have both been good friends of mine for quite a few years. I could probably talk for hours for the experiences that Carol and Betty and I have all seen everywhere we've traveled for Alcons and within the Astronomical League, but I, I won't bore everybody with that. Uh, he's been keeping up with the League members, writing the What's Up With The League newsletter. And Carol is a really active person with a lot of different organizations. He volunteers a lot of time doing what he can to help anyone he can. And he is very active in the, I believe it's the Astronomical League of Kansas City, is it Carol? Yep. All right, Carol, I'm going to turn it over to you to update us a little bit on the league. Thank you so much, Terry. And uh, I'm glad you didn't share all those secrets because not all that should be published, I think so. Anyway, but anyway, yeah, it, it's very nice to be here. Scotty, thanks so much for making this possible. And uh, I'm going to uh, give a combination of upgrades of what's going on with the league, as well as just explaining what all the league's about, because I know we've got an audience, uh, uh, many of whom uh, know about the league, but some who may not. So let me see if I can get started here and share my screen. Can you see that, uh, Scott? And not yet. Okay. What about now? Uh, not yet. Okay. So just go down. To, okay, now you're gone. Right, here we're going. Here we right. go. Hey, it's so good to be Scotty, here. You... Uh, many of you, I'm sure, on the same boat as we are uh, in the Midwest. Uh, we're not having uh, many star parties at all. Uh, we're finding new ways of doing that. And we're getting all kinds of reports from new clubs all the time that are finding very creative ways of reaching the public. Some of the benefits for people who haven't been around the league or maybe some who've been around the league but haven't uh, uh, caught up with what the new things are for several years. Here are some of the benefits, and I won't bore you with listing all the objects. We have the Reflector magazine. Any member gets that, which has really reached a new high in recent years. And Terry was talking about the Alcon National Conventions. 
for the first time since World War II, we had to cancel our 2020 uh, convention in Albuquerque, but uh, we're going to try to get it right in 2021. I'll say more about that in just a little bit. Uh, we have uh, various other uh, uh, benefits that I'll get into with individual slides here in just a second. We are 300 astronomical societies strong, and we have many members at large across the country and the world. We have 18,000 members in all the clubs, and we're just moving in to international memberships, and we're really excited about that program as well, since astronomy is a worldwide situation. We'll talk briefly about the regions, and Carl will say more about his individual region here in just a few minutes. We have 10 across the country, uh, some of which have several miles involved to get from one uh, organization to another. And like I say, we just now are starting the international region. The reflector, uh, it has just been come out the last one for December. And if you need a copy of that, uh, let us know at the national office. We'll get you a complimentary copy of, uh, for that. It's also online at the website. One of the big things that we have at the Astronomical League are observing awards. And that's one of the main benefits that a lot of people uh, belong for. We have various levels of uh, observing award programs, starting with uh, uh, Sky Puppy for kids. That's when the kids can get out and learn the sky and uh, uh, then move up to other things. Another thing that's been very popular is the Universe Sampler. It's just like it says, a sampling of several things that uh, you can see in the night sky. And then if you have, and most people do have a pair of binoculars, if not get with Scott, he'll get you a very nice pair. And there's many ways of uh, using, get out there on the night sky and uh, looking up with binoculars. You don't have, always have to have a telescope for some awards. There's one there, uh, you do have to travel to the southern sky to see that it gives lots of our astronomy friends excuses to go to the southern hemisphere. Then for the intermediate observer, we have the asteroid program, uh, Caldwell, uh, Double Star, Messier. And Messier is one of the uh, first programs most people uh, set up for their observing program. We have 110 objects and uh, started by uh, uh, they were all observed by Messier, Charles Messier, and more. And then for the advanced observers who have seen everything else in the other ones, we have uh, the Our Peculiar Galaxy program and so on, all the way up to Herschel 2, and we're constantly adding more. Uh, we're now up to about 75 programs, and we'll talk in just a few minutes about another uh, new program we're very excited about uh, with the uh, Explore Scientific. And astronomers tend to be a pen collectors. And here's a good excuse. If you didn't have an excuse already to start observing the night sky, you get a nice pen for many of these programs. We also have manuals that accompany some of the awards programs. And it makes it just a little bit easier as you're going through your journey of uh, doing whatever certificate you're working for. One of the awards we're very proud of is the Leslie C. Peltier Award. And we talked about that earlier. And we're very grateful for Spore Scientific for sponsoring this. It's presented to an amateur astronomer who has contributed to astronomical observation of lasting significance. And, we're, <clears throat> excuse me, we were able to present this in person this year, so we were able to run down the uh, award winner. He's from uh, New Mexico, and he's displaying the plaque uh, that he received and the telescope he uses, and so we made it happen. His name is Howard J. Brewington. Thank you, Scott, for sponsoring yet another uh, effort for uh, uh, the Astronomical League. That's great. Thank you. And another uh, program sponsored by Explore Scientific is the National Young Astronomer Award. It's amazing what uh, uh, skills 
are found in high school age students. You know, we hear about education is not what it could be, but I'll tell you, dealing with these kids that we deal with each year and this program, they are really into science with uh, uh, both feet. They're, they're doing very well. Here's our first place award winner, Karen uh, Lay from uh, uh, California. Uh, she, uh, the image on the right there, she set up her own, built it actually, her radio telescope setup. And it's just amazing what she was able to do. She not only set it up, but also did all the research that uh, for her, her project. Second place was Vivek. He is 16 years old, going on about 35 or 40. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, and I'm gonna talk more about him on a future slide here. Here's the name of his uh, research here, characterizing the pulsations of Delta Scuta stars using the MG1B triplet. Uh, one of the things <clears throat> that uh, his sponsor said about him was that he could take the subject like this, that not everybody knows uh, the ins and outs of it and make it explainable to lay people. And that's a gift for any age, but particularly for someone uh, 16 years old. And there's, uh, Vivek was again, uh, the winner of the one on the left, the Horkheimer Smith Award. This, he gave a talk in California, several talks involving that subject, spectroscopic too. And his sponsor was uh, inviting him back several times for that talk in various parts of California, because like I say, he explained it so easily to uh, lay people who knew nothing at all about astronomy, but can make it understandable. The uh, other uh, uh, service award winner for the Horkheimer series was uh, Ja Chat with building a telescope display. He set up at the library and he actually set up a uh, outreach event where he uh, showed what it took to build a very basic telescope. Another uh, award we give from the youth side is the Horkheimer Parker Youth Imaging Award. And the second part of that is named after Don Parker. Many of you know him from the Winter Star Party, and he's also internationally known in Alpo as well. Uh, uh, was the first place winner. And this image of the Milky Way was imaged from downtown Houston and he did a tremendous job. One of the things uh, he and his family do is travel the world in search of locations for dark skies so he can do this kind of imaging. And he's uh, like uh, 14 or 15 years old and just really enjoys it and does a very good job of it. This year, we had sort of a unique situation. We have a uh, Horkheimer O'Meara Journalism Award that gives an award to kids who work, who uh, give a presentation, who write up an article, an essay about astronomy or science in general. And this year we had a uh, family uh, first and second place winner. First place winner was Lucia Castillo, uh, shown with the plaque there. And her brother to her right was Stephen. He was also the uh, second place winner. And so we kept it in the family there. Uh, they were sponsored by the Northwest Suburban Astronomers. And so we're very pleased to uh, uh, welcome them uh, for their sponsorship. An adult award, another adult award we have at the league level is the Mabel Stearns Newsletter Editor Award. It's presented for an outstanding amateur league society newsletter and of course, Newsletters have evolved. They're uh, uh, mostly digital now. The first place winner this year was Bruce Bowman from the Indiana Astronomical Society. We have a Webmaster Award for the best society website. Uh, sometimes we take the award where the event and the person is, and that's what we did a few years ago. I had the honor of presenting at the Springfield Telescope Makers. Uh, at Stella Fane, and that was a very positive experience. 
One of our newer programs is the Horkheimer Library Telescope Program. Each of our 10 regions are eligible to uh, submit an application for setting up a telescope in one of the libraries and their local location. We award one for each, uh, each region. And that's been very successful. That program has been extremely successful countrywide and it's allowing astronomy to be uh, accessed by people in uh, areas that would never have that if it wasn't going to the public library. We were talking earlier about Alcon 2021 and David, uh, keep your fingers crossed. I think we can make it happen. Uh, registration, we think will be up around the first of the year. Uh, Embassy Suites is a wonderful location for it. Something different that we're going to be doing this year is having our Alcon Junior portion of that. That is headed up by Peggy Walker. And that's an opportunity for the kids to uh, assemble their telescopes and also have a lot of fun <clears throat> learning more about astronomy in the process. That'll be sponsored by the, or hosted by the Albuquerque Astronomical Society. So mark that on your calendar, August 5th through 7th. I hope to see everyone there. Another award that we have uh, yearly is Astronomy Day. The uh, 2021 dates are May 15th and October 9th. And we have some repeat groups that routinely submit an application for this because they're out there every Astronomy Day sharing astronomy with the public. And we really appreciate that. And uh, if you notice here, the deadline is June 13. If in your local clubs or you have someone uh, who is willing to uh, uh, organize that, we would love to have you participate and, and send an application. At the bottom there is the contact person. Uh, Gary Thomason handles that program for the league and we'd be delighted to have you participate. If you want to get a hold of the league for some reason, that's your contact number by phone or by email there at the bottom. And so I think I'm about done with my allotted, allotted 10 minutes. Terry, am I still on track? I think we're about right. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carol, appreciate that. It's nice to hear everything that is going on and we sure do hope Albuquerque can happen. So what I'd like to do now is I know Scott does not need an introduction, but Scott, I'm going to introduce you anyway. Oh no. <laughs> yes, Scott and Carol are going to talk about uh, some of the, one of the new um, awards, one of the new uh, programs coming up. And so I've known Scott for years, as you, everybody can probably tell, everybody pretty much knows Scott. I think the first time I met him was at an Alcon. And I needed to buy a flip mirror for my telescope. And you were the one I talked to that fixed me up with a flip mirror. Mm. And over the years, we have been involved in so many projects, um, so many conferences at the same time. Um, just if it was astronomy, you know, it's amazing because the astronomy community really is a community. We're like, we're all like an extended family. Pretty much all of us have known everybody for quite a few years. Um, but, but Scott's always, whether you were at the Winter Star Party or wherever, if there was something going on and you needed help or you needed advice or needed to borrow something, Scott was always there. He, he made it easy for us amateur astronomers if there was a problem to go and say, hey, I've got this, but I could I'd like to see your eyepiece in my telescope. And there were times he would let us borrow that and actually be able to use borrow his equipment for a little while to test out. And that just amazed me. But what we're really grateful for is exactly what Carol said too. Another thing we are grateful for is his support or explore scientific support for the National Young Astronomer Award and the Leslie C. Peltier Award. I mean, you have just helped tremendously recognize so many people and so many kids. And we greatly appreciate that. And as you can have all seen, he puts on fantastic global star parties. Last night, Mount Wilson was amazing. I loved it. I, I've never seen Uranus and its moons like that in my life. The nebulas, uh, everything, Mars even looked good, everything. That was incredible to me. I really enjoyed the great 
or the Mount Wilson star party. And I think everybody else did from what I have seen. And so he's always helped with educational astronomy too. So for that and all of the above, Scott, thank you for all of your help, everything you've done. Amazing guy. If you got any questions, talk to him. And I'm going to turn this over to you and Carol to talk about what you're going to talk about. Okay. Gosh, Terry, thank you. I'm I'm uh, I'm blushing over here. <laughs> so thank you very much. It was very kind. Um, so uh, Carol and I have been. Uh, well, actually, it was Carol that approached uh, approached me and Explore Scientific to be sponsor of yet another award, and this one would be about astrophotography. And uh, I have here in front of me, um, uh, you know the entry form. Uh, so how, how does the, from the league standpoint, uh, Carol, how does the, uh, how do people uh, enter into this program? And, um, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what historically has happened? I think that OPT at one point was sponsor of this. Maybe they kicked it off. Um, yes, OPT was a major sponsor for several years. And what happened, we had submissions of astrophotography work, imaging as uh, it's also called in certain quarters. And, uh, and so there was an application process that they went through by having it by a certain date, and then we gave an award out each year. So uh, Scott and I have talked about enhancing that process and making it uh, something that uh, would get a lot more uh, 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 participation, I think in that we very possibly would model that uh, similarly after astronomy uh, picture of the day, not that we would have a picture each day for this program, but maybe once a week or something like that, and really get some interest across the country and the world uh, of this program. Uh, we would probably uh, recognize participants on a weekly basis, and then uh, at the end of the year, then come up with a grand champion, so to speak, from our judges and really honor the uh, astrophotographers and imagers who put so much into this. I know not too many years ago, uh, the league we were talking about doing something for imaging because they have seen everything in the sky, but they were still loving to take the pictures, but there was nothing for them from the league level. So that's what got us into it originally. But I see this as a really an opportunity to enhance this. And Scott, thank you so much for stepping forward and being so generous. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited about it. Um, I'm excited that the league uh, uh, is embracing the idea of um, uh, giving more exposure to more people. There's a lot of great astrophotographers out there, and it will be truly difficult to pick out the very best image, you know. So. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm happy just to be the sponsor of it and not the judge <laughs> because this is going to be tough. So we're going to have more than one to take the pressure off the judge just a little bit. <laughs> That's the way to do it. You just sponsor it. You don't, you don't get involved in judging it. So <laughs> yeah, okay. but it is an honor and I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about the program. Yeah. And to echo what uh, Terry said, yeah, you've always been there for the league for many, many years. Uh, had a very good relationship all the way through and it's yeah very much no, i love the league and i love all you guys so yeah well thank you oops better unmute myself well stay tuned for more information on that we will publish it just as soon as we uh firm up some details thank you carol what i'd like to do now um we're a little ways in um, let's start with Shailendra. Do you have any dark skies right now that you could show us anything, Shailendra? Hey, Terry. Yeah, give me two seconds. Let me just get sure. on screen. Now, Shailendra's in the UK. Um, he has been uh, on many of the global star parties. And uh, just in the last few months, we've seen his work just get better and better and better. So he's he's really becoming uh, uh, entering the realm of master astrophotographer. So, cheers, Scott. Thanks for that. Um, 
So I'm sharing my screen now. Um, if you can see, it's guided. I've had to start it again because I hit clouds. Oh, and there we go. An image has just popped on screen as the clouds have cleared. And that's a five minute image of the North American Nebula. And the guiding's not been too bad on that at all, actually. If I zoom in a little bit. Yeah, maybe you can move the dialog box so they can see the image a little better. Yeah. Uh, the, the guiding. There you go. Oh, wow. Okay. That's, that's North American for sure. That is nice. That's not bad guiding. It's 72% zoomed in. Stars are still round. And the detail's really clear. It's still a little bit cloudy, but it's not too bad. I have got better images of that one. Um, if I share this one. Here's an image that I got last week. That was an hour wow. on each filter of SHO. Oh, and there we go. Clouds have just come in. Mm -hmm. Oh, they've gone. But, you know, it is amazing to see the live images. I mean, we're looking... Um, Shailendra, are you in London? Um, about 20 miles out, really. So yeah. It's amazing to be able to see your sky, though. I mean, you're the only one on here tonight right now that is in darkness. So thank you so much for showing us that. And we might pop back to you again here in a little bit. No worries. Thanks for having me. Cheers, Terry. Right. Thank you, Shailendra. Um, Molly, we're going to come up to you next, but what I am going to do, Molly's going to be speaking for about 15 minutes. Um, we have Simon Tang and Howard Eskelson um, in Florida. Simon's in California and Howard's in Florida. Uh, you guys kind of get ready after Molly, and I'm going to come to you both uh, real quick after Molly gets done. So I am going to introduce Molly, and I have known Molly for a while, too. Um, I'm in Dayton, she was in Dayton, so we have um, known each other for a while. But Molly got into astrophotography in July of 2015 after receiving her first telescope as a gift. There was much trial and error, and later she has now has three astrophotography rigs set up in her backyard in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, she, she has dedicated one of them to variable star and expo, exoplanet uh, transit observation. She is very involved in STEM outreach, having accrued more than 100 hours of volunteer activities, reaching over a thousand people. She is a AA VSO ambassador and Explore, Science, or Explore Alliance ambassador, and is a panelist and broadcaster on the Astro Imaging Channel YouTube show. Molly is currently pursuing her PhD in physics at the University of California, Berkeley, where she studies with her two cats, Orion and Apollo. So Molly, welcome. Good to see you again. You can take it from here. All righty. Um, well, I've got one of my cats here with me. This is- <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> He's standing on top of the green screen. So <laughs> oh, you can go to the Milky Way. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, my other cat Apollo is uh, elsewhere in the house, probably taking a nap or or destroying my Christmas tree. One of the two. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, let me go ahead and get my screen shared here. And my slides. Yeah. There we go. Uh, all right, so um, uh, in addition to the, uh, the League's uh, imaging competition, there is also the League's uh, imaging ob observing program um, that uh, I think is gonna be uh, talked about in, uh, in a little bit later on this program. Um, so in order to get involved in that, uh, in both the imaging competition and the, uh, and the imaging program, uh, much like the observing programs, now they have a, an imaging program as well that I'm very excited about and I'm going to definitely submit for, I think I have almost everything I need <laughs> to submit for that somewhere in my 500 plus images. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so I'm going to talk about how you can get started in astrophotography and the how the league's imaging program is a good way to learn astrophotography since it requires imaging a wide variety of, of targets and kind of gives you some some framework on, on what kinds of things to image. Uh, so um, uh, a little about me, Terry uh, did a very nice job introducing me. So I'll just uh, show off the, the pictures I have here. Um, those are two of my um, two out of my three rigs. Although I just got a new mount for the one over there on the left. I have an Ioptron Sem 40 that I just got up and running and it's working very, very nicely so far. So very excited about that. Um, and I have my uh, really fun little camper there that I can now use to go out to dark sky sites. I just got earlier this year, very excited about that. Uh, and I, I do most of my imaging from here in my backyard in the San Francisco area. And um, I've been able to do a lot more now that I've gotten some narrowband filters, but occasionally I do go out to dark sky sites to be able to do better with my wideband stuff, uh, like the Iris Nebula there on the left. Um, so uh, the, uh, the imaging program requires that you capture a lot of different types of objects. So uh, I'm going to have some, some examples of that later on in, in today's show. Um, but uh, here's the types of, of things that the, that the program requires you to image as well as the, uh, some optional things on the upcoming slides. So, um, open clusters, globular clusters, and these are all, all images that I'll likely be submitting <laughs> for, for these categories, although I have a, a pretty cool one for Dark Nebula that I'm going to do instead of this one. Um, but, uh, and then some, some uh, the, the, uh, the uh, optional pieces, because you have to submit uh, 25 deep sky images total. So um, here's some other kinds of options that you can submit for all those categories, including uh, variable stars, if you want to get into doing scientific observing, I'm not going to get into how to do that today because that's a whole like separate talk. Um, but I do have some talks with the AAVS Center on YouTube who, uh, and many others uh, who have presented on the topic as well on how to image variable stars and, and uh, NOBI. And of course, there's the uh, solar system side of the house as well, uh, which kind of has some, some different equipment requirements, but it's actually probably an easier place to start for a lot of people, depending on what, what gear you have, because the you don't need as good of tracking and you don't need as good of, of imaging equipment. Uh, I've not actually ever imaged an asteroid before, so I'm going to have to have to do that here pretty soon. Uh, and then some, some uh, other things you can image in the solar system as well. All right, so um, as far as getting into astrophotography, let's talk about the couple of different kinds of telescopes that are good for doing astrophotography. Uh, first, uh, and then they all have their, their pros and cons. So uh, refractors are a really good place to start if you're not really sure where to start. Uh, because of their wider field of view and their fast focal ratios, they, are, they don't require as, as high end of a mount to be able to stay steady and stay on target and, and have nice round stars. Um, and they do vary in price quite a lot depending on uh, how nice of one you get, how long a focal length, how big of aperture, things like that. Uh, but there's quite a few affordable ones out there. Uh, however, they're kind of, you're kind of limited to the types of targets you can do because of their wide field of view. Uh, they're not great for doing most galaxies or most planetary nebula. Um, and getting ones that have good optical quality can, can cost a fair bit of money. Uh, a lot of people may have Newtonians that they've used for visual observing. And unfortunately, a lot of the visual observing Newtonians don't focus. So uh, there's, there's Newtonians that are built for imaging that have the primary mirror moved up a bit uh, so that the uh, cameras can reach focus. But they do tend to be a little lighter weight than uh, at least than, than some other types of telescopes, although they can also be heavier depending on which kind you have. Um, they often have very fast focal ratios and are kind of the middle of the road between having a small field of view and a large field of view. So you can access a wide variety of, of targets and be able to get nice images of those. Um, Uh, you may like or you may not like. I really like seeing diffraction specs, um, but I, I haven't done any any uh, a whole lot of deep sky astrophotography with a Newtonian. I'm currently using my Newtonian for the variable star 
observing because I haven't got a coma corrector working for it quite yet. <laughs> uh, and then of course there's Schmidt Cassegrains, which is where I actually started for astrophotography, which is probably, uh, it's a pretty difficult place to start for astrophotography, but um, it's, they're excellent for doing planetary imaging. It's really what you're gonna, gonna need for doing that. Um, they tend to be a little on the, on the cheaper side, uh, even though, I mean, it's astro gear, nothing was really cheap. Um, the optics are a little easier to correct. Uh, you can, um, uh, focal reducer slash field flatteners are, are relatively inexpensive. Um, but they do have some optical uh, issues that make your images not always as gorgeous as ones out of refractors, for example. The secondary mirror makes stars a little bit mushy. The mirror can flop around. Uh, things like that. Uh, so when it comes to uh, mounts for doing deep sky astrophotography, you're taking long exposures. You need a mount that is stable. You need a mount that's going to be able to hold the telescope that you have, and it needs to be computerized so that you can uh, tell it to go to a target and so that it will track on that target. And you, but you also want it to be relatively portable, especially if you don't have a nice backyard setup. You don't want to have to be lugging uh, 100 or 200 pounds of gear up and down the stairs of your second story apartment like I've done in the past. <laughs> um, you, uh, then you'll be less likely to actually go out and do astrophotography. And there's quite a lot that you need to do in order to, uh, to do this program. So you want to get a mount that is uh, light, light enough to be able to handle and move in and out of your house, but also is robust enough to be able to track well with, with the telescope halo that you have. Generally, the rule of thumb is the capacity of the mount, which is the amount of telescope and camera capacity. That capacity usually does not include the counterweights um, because you can, so, so you can ignore, um, you don't have to add in the, the counterweights in order to figure out whether you're mount can hold your telescope or not. Generally for good astrophotography, you want to stay at about half of that payload capacity. So let's say the payload capacity of the mount you're looking at is, is 40 pounds. Then you'll need to have a telescope and camera set up that weighs 20 pounds or less in general. There are some mounts that can handle a lot higher fraction of that payload capacity and still have good tracking, uh, but that's kind of the, the, the approximate rule of thumb. When it comes to cameras, a, if you, a good place to start if, if you're totally new to it is with a DSLR. They're multi-purpose, they're relatively cheap. You can see the images right away. You don't need a computer to control it. It's kind of an easier entry point. Um, however, they're, they tend to be noisier because they're not cooled. They have a spectrum filter that makes them really great for getting good colors in your daytime imaging, but blocks a lot of the red signal that is present in space so that uh, you don't get as, as good of reds uh, like, like in a lot of the large emission nebulae and stuff like that. Um, and they, they tend to be less sensitive than the Astro dedicated cameras and not as many of the astrophotography software programs support capturing with the DSLR. So you kind of have to hand jam it a little bit sometimes. On the other hand, there are dedicated Astro cameras that uh, are cooled. So you have much lower noise designed for astrophotography, don't have that spectrum filter, but they are more, a diff more difficult place to start for newbies because you have to use a computer to control them. Um, but, uh, and they're a little pricier, but you will get higher quality images out of them. Although I have gotten some really good images out of my DSLRs. So uh, if, if, that's, if you have a DSLR or, or aren't ready to spend a thousand dollars on an astro camera yet, or are getting into the technology, a DSLR is a great place to start. And you, you can still get nice images out of a DSLR. Uh, in fact, the, the image that uh, the OPT Astronomical League Imaging Award uh, that existed previously actually got second place in that competition was an image I took with my DSLR. So uh, you can still quite, do quite well with those. All right, so there's a lot of different software out there. It can be hard to know where to start. So I've laid out a list here for you for doing deep sky imaging. On the basic side of the house, if you have a DSLR, an intervalometer is a good place to, to start because there's no computer control required. You plug it in and you can, you can program the intervalometer to say, all right, I want you to take 160 second exposures and it will click that camera for you so you don't have to sit out there with like a timer or something like that. Uh, it, it, will, it will take care of that for you so you can go get a cup of hot cocoa. Um, Backyard Nikon, Backyard EOS is a relatively cheap program that uh, they 
so the Nikon one obviously controls Nikons, the EOS one controls Canon cameras. Uh, to be able to do that camera control via a computer so you can see the images bigger and um, and have greater access to, to more features and things like that. Uh, Sharp Cap, which does technically work with Canon cameras with a new driver that has come out recently, but that driver is still in development. Um, it's really more designed to work with Astro cameras like the ZWOs, the QHYs, the, um, the cameras along those lines. And then for controlling your telescope mount, uh, you can use uh, CARTS DCL or Stellarium or EQ mod, uh, depending on the type of mount that you have, to do basic like you know point to this target, point to that target from your computer, as opposed to having to sit there with a the hand controller. Uh, so those are just some options. On the more advanced side of the house, if you want to start to automate your telescope, so I've got my three rigs out in the backyard. I run them all night long and I go to sleep and Sequence Generator Pro runs it all for me. And some people use Nina, which is a relatively new open source program, uh, Voyager, uh, the SkyX, and there's some other ones that kind of increase in price as, as you go along. And then uh, for processing, it, to, to get started, uh, Deep Sky Stacker is a good place to start. There's a lot of tutorials out there, um, but for making higher quality images, you'll want to get Photoshop or PixInsight or these other programs listed here to, to start making some, some higher quality images. But Deep Sky Stacker is a good place to start if you're just getting into it. Um, if Now on the solar system side of the house, it's kind of some different requirements. You will need a longer focal length telescope to be able to get any kind of detail on the planets or on the moon or on the sun. Uh, and you can add a bar load to increase that resolution uh, or that magnification. And I, I've, I've really the, the king of the crop for planetary imaging is Schmidt Cassegrains. That's what all the, so the people like uh, Christopher Goh, Damian Peach, uh, people who take really incredible planetary images tend to use Schmidt Cassegrains. They've got really long focal length and a pretty compact package. Now, the nice thing about doing planetary imaging is that you don't need really a good mount at all. It does not have to be an equatorial mount even. Uh, it doesn't have to track very well. I use my, I frequently use my, my Celestron Nexstar SE, which is an Altaz mount that's uh, pretty affordable. The whole package of the eight inch telescope and the mount uh, only is like $1,200. And uh, it's a great planetary imaging platform. It's, it's really easy to use. You don't need, uh, and well, Altaz mounts in general, you don't need to polar align and do all those somewhat more complicated things. But you can even hand track a Dobsonian or if you have uh, like a go-to Dobsonian with, with, with tracking in, in one of the axes, uh, you can, because you, the exposure times on planetary images are very short. So you don't need long exposure tracking, just enough for a fraction of a second uh, per frame to get a video. So you can even hand track a Dobsonian if, if that's what you have for doing planetary imaging. I've seen, I've actually seen some really good results of the International Space Station from hand tracked Dobsonians. It's really cool. The camera requirements are also less stringent. Uh, I have used a DSLR for doing planetary uh, imaging, although the video compression makes for some artifacts. Uh, but instead of a DSLR, you can also spend like 150 bucks and get one of the one of the cheap um, uh, planetary or auto guiding cameras that have high frame rates and uh, they are computer controlled, but um, they're they're a lot cheaper the the ones that are not cooled. Um, and have and have much smaller chips. So uh, cameras like the uh, actually I'm, I'm going to have some examples on a, on a following slide here of, of specific models to take a look at. Um, but uh, yeah, those those little cheap cameras that you can use for auto guiding uh, actually make great planetary cameras. Uh, software for capturing uh, Sharp Cap and Fire Capture the two that people tend to use the most often. There's some other ones out there just to acquire those videos. And then for doing the processing, Registax, AutoStacker are kind of the two main programs. I've had more success with AutoStacker, but then I actually use them both because I do the stacking in AutoStacker and the wavelet deconvolution, AKA the sharpening in Registax. And there's a lot of internet tutorials out there on how to do that as well. Um, so uh, here's an example of a, of a good deep sky setup that is still budget, as, as we'll call it in, in a, a astronomical terms here. <laughs> uh, if you get a refractor um, and a lightweight equatorial mount, a one-shot color camera, and a light pollution filter, you can do quite a lot of imaging with that setup 
uh, on the two to four grand range. And you can use that same mount with a schmidt cassegrain telescope, or if you have like a simple Altaz mount for visual observing, which is the one I use for all my outreach activities, um, then you can get a lot of planetary imaging out of that as well with a cheap one-shot color camera. Um, and that setup tends to be less expensive. Now, all that being said, those are recommendations. Those are things that will get you good images, but use whatever you have. There's, you'll hear people say, uh, oh, you gotta have this telescope, you gotta have this mount or else it's not gonna work. I started with uh, the, the one on the right, which is the Altaz mount, a Schmidt Castigrain, no focal reducer and a DSLR. And I got images that, you know, nowadays, you know, uh, I look back, I'm like, oh man, that, that would have been, those aren't the best images, but at the time I was so excited about them and they meet the requirements for the uh, for the imaging program, uh, the observing program. So um, get started with whatever you have and kind of you can grow from there and um, look for cheap used gear on Astromart and other things like that. So use what you have, do what you can. And it's a really awesome side of the hobby to get into astrophotography. That's what I've got. All right, thank you, Molly. Appreciate that. A lot of good information in there. Um, and we, we're going to discuss the program a little bit here in a few minutes. Uh, Simon, are you there? And do you have any views of the sun at this time? I am here. And yes, there is oh, a view God. of the sun. Um, unfortunately, seeing is really starting to go downhill compared to what it was when we first started this. But what I'm going to talk about real quick here is this is the sunspot uh, 2790. For those of you who have been following this sunspot, this was actually the cause of an M-class solar flare that occurred about, I don't know, three, four days ago. And basically what that means uh, for us is we now know that the sun is truly awake and is active um, because obviously there's a lot more activity than what we'd normally have. And to have a solar flare signifies that solar cycle 25 is definitely underway. Um, I'm just going to show you a quick picture of the same sunspot from earlier this morning. And what you're actually seeing here is there was actually a flare in progress uh, when we first started looking at this. And myself and Scott Roberts, when we logged in, we saw how he described it as a tube of toothpaste being squirted out. And this is essentially, it's a inverted image. So obviously the tube of toothpaste is now turned black as opposed to white, but we actually saw this thing unfold in real time and actually just leaping across and it was gone just as quick as it showed up. Uh, but I think from what I can confirm, we caught the tail end of this solar flare. That's nice. That's amazing to be able to see that. I'm sitting under clouds. Yeah, it's not often we get to see uh, stuff like this happen in real time. Um, I mean, this is probably one of the ones that I've actually been able to witness in real time, which is kind of a shame because the one that happened, we couldn't see it. And by the time it happened, we got these amazing coronal loops, which is another rare phenomenon that occurs on the sun. And oh, yeah, it was just everybody was just going crazy. Anybody to do with solar was going crazy. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I love that first image you showed. That's amazing to be able to see that kind of action on the sun after it's been quiet for so long. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I think this is what everybody's been waiting for uh, when it comes down to solar, because we've had such a quiet spell of almost, what, two years with just nothing happening. Maybe yeah. the odd splattering here and there. Obviously, we had the eclipse uh, back in 2017. So the, you know, it's we're looking forward to more and more activity as it goes on. Although I think this um, cycle is going to be slightly quieter than cycle 24. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> I want my Aurora back. <laughs> well, uh, well, technically we should have had an Aurora recently because of that flare that occurred. In fact, actually I will, let me show you guys a quick uh, video. Needless to say, I don't need to do a screen share because of the way I'm doing all of this. But this video shows this flare of occurring. Uh, this is actually through stereo A, which is actually not in the view of Earth. 
So the next one um, image that you're going to see is a chronograph, and you'll see that coming towards us. So there it is again, closer up. So we should have seen some activity in terms of aurora from this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, burp. <laughs> <laughs> That's that is amazing. Well, thank you, Simon. I sure do appreciate that. Uh, Howard, are you set up in Florida? Well, yes and no, but now there's a giant or arboreal sunspot. Uh, in other words, it's, cut, it's gone behind a tree. I don't have any visual images. I could share images I took earlier this morning if you would like. Uh, yeah, they, go ahead and show us a couple of those. Okay, okay I'll go ahead and, and get that and we'll get the white light. Now, let's see. Okay, I got to go to screen share, right? Yes. Okay. And that's what I want right there. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Yep. Okay. And let's see, there's, now there's a thing, right? There's a DOS, there we go. There we go, there was a pop-up screen right in the middle. We've got the spot here, I believe this is, yeah. Well, I'm getting, this, this is right, left, reverse. And the, the big spot that was on the sun earlier is over here where the pointer is. And let's see, that was 27, uh, what was that? 2786. Uh, that was 2786, 85 has gone around. And then this is, uh, 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 2790, and there's actually a little spot here. Let me see if I can get this enlarged just a little bit so you can see. There's a little spot group right over in here that hasn't gotten a number yet. And moving on over, this is in calcium K, and calcium K is where the action is if you want to see the magnetic fields. We've got an old tired magnetic field there that was associated spots on a pre with spots on a previous rotation. We've got the 2786 uh, spot with its plage. And you've got the uh, magnetic remnants here. You've got the magnetic remnants. And I forget what the number of this one was. It actually had spots in it. But you've got those magnetic remnants. And then this is with uh, uh, 2790. And the thing about these, these are all tired and worn out. They're just spread out. So they become more and more diffuse. And eventually, they go into the background. You get kind of this background uh, granulation. But this is a more compact over here, this new spot unnamed, it's more compact, so it's, it's arisen fairly recently, but I don't expect great things to come to that. I think it'll be just a few spots and then it'll disappear. And then finally, the other thing that I have, this is, cal uh, is H-alpha, and calcium K and H-alpha are what we call the chromosphere of the sun. It's uh, just a couple hundred meter, uh, or a couple thousand kilometers above the, sur the visible surface of the sun, which is what we see in white light. But again, here's the spots, 2790, 2786, and you can kind of see some tangling stuff here that's associated with the plage, associated with this new spot. And up here, again, this uh, shows the magnetic fields um, and some of the spicules that come off of that. Um, I didn't, well, let's see, I did. Okay, here's a second exposure that shows some of the prominences around the edge. There's actually a minimal one here, but it's pretty hard to see. But these are basically the images taken from today. And it's really fun to watch this as it progresses day after day. Well, thank you, Howard. Yeah, it's, we'll come back probably before this is over and see, check with you and Simon and Shailendra and see what's going on a little bit more. So thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. My pleasure. Okay. Molly, uh, you, oh, you and I are going to talk a little bit. Uh, the new imaging program that we have been talking about from the Astronomical League is called Foundations of Imaging Observing Program. And that is the name of it. And Molly and I, um, Molly, if it's okay, I'll go ahead like we talked about and I'll go ahead and start off and then I'm gonna let you wrap up. How about that? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. And what I'm gonna do, oops, there we go. And that's one of the images of the sun I took in H alpha. It's been a while since I took that. Wow. But one of the things I wanted to go over with was the imaging targets for this award. Our constellations and asterisms, nightscapes, meteors, lunar and solar, stars, binary, variable, and nova, planets, deep space objects, comets and asteroids, and eclipses and occultations. Now, I am one right now that has been using a DSLR. So all the images here that you are gonna see that I took are DSLR. And this is through a SolarMax 90 that I took. And that one of the requirements is the full disk of the sun, whether it's in white light or H alpha. And so that would be one of the requirements. You can see where there's some um, 
prominence is up here and on the edges, but it doesn't have to be H alpha. White light will work just as well. Uh, lunar, you can also take pictures of the moon. The full disk of the moon is one of them. And these are part of the, um, you need 28 of the solar system also. These two would be included in the solar system. And then what I wanted to jump to was I have been doing a lot of uh, nightscapes. And that's one of the things that with the Aurora that I also do. And there is an option that if you can't get some of these 28 that you need above, you can use some nightscapes. And so this one I took uh, up on Lake Superior and uh, you can see the Milky Ways in the back. And that would be one of those that you could use for the foreground and the night sky. So that would be another option. And all I'm doing, this was taken with a Canon 6D and just a tripod. So you can start this program off very simply if you want to until you get more information and learn more about imaging with a deep sky or an astro dedicated camera. You can start off this way and learn more as you go or save money as you go and build up and get your camera. This one is um, one of the zodiacal light with the Milky Way. And again, this is a panoramic. I think I took five shots and stitched them together, but that would also be usable as a Milky Way shot. Or you can take any, the Milky Way off of the first picture would have worked too. So this is another idea that you can use. And you can learn more about photography when you start, you need to start to understand the workings of the sky, the constellations, how things move, everything that's up there. You need to learn that. I mean, you gotta have a computer. I mean, it's nice to have a go-to at some time, but it's really nice to know the sky yourself. Not everybody does, but let's say your batteries die. You're kind of dead in the water if you don't know where anything is at. So it is good to know at least the basic, the major constellations, but the more you know, the better it will be. Like here, you can see Orion setting right down here. It's getting ready to set into the ocean. Um, and so the more you know, the more you're going to learn. And very honestly, with League Observe programs, you will learn. It is not something that you say, oh, that's a breeze, that's easy, I can do this whole program in three nights. If you do that, then you will not have learned anything. Um, they, are, they can be tough, and that's part of the good challenge of it. It makes you learn. Uh, Star Trails is another one that uh, you can use also in this program. And again, simple tripod, camera, and that's at StarQuest Star Party, Green Bank, West Virginia. Um, amazing things that you can see and do. Oh, and uh, time lapse. Let's see if this is going to work. This is a time lapse that I did in Alaska. Watch the ground, how it lights up. This is very short, but this is real time aurora. Wow. Look at the real ground. Time. Wow. If you could hear everybody cheering and screaming at that point, you would not believe it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, time lapse oh, is another lapse. one that you can do that is a simple camera and tripod. You can learn how to shoot star trails, how to do time lapse, how to shoot the Milky Way in a foreground object. Those are things that you can learn as you build into getting a dedicated astro camera. So Molly, that is going to wrap my section up. I am going to turn it over to you. There is a question, Terry. Uh, okay. Somebody wants to know, how do I sign up for this program? Uh, you need to be a member of the Astronomical League. And once you become a member, you will be able to do any of the Astronomical League programs that we have. They are on the Astronomical League website, which I bet Scott is typing in right now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so when you do that, you will find there is a coordinator for every program that we have. And the coordinator for this program, I know, I believe I know his name, but I'm not going to say it till I find it, is Don, Dan, I'm sorry, Dan Croson from Missouri. And I think it was he and two other men that put this program together. So any one of our 80 plus programs, you just go to the website, you will see who to contact, and that's how you get started. And once you do this, 
uh, you will have, I don't know for sure if this has a certificate or a pin, but some of our awards do have the pins too. So very easy to get started. So if there, Scott, is there anything else that I'm missing? We good to go to Molly? If there is, we'll figure it out and talk about it later. <laughs> okay, Molly, go ahead and take it. All right, sorry, my screen froze there for just a second, but I'll go ahead and get here. Uh, all right, so um, I wanted to put up some examples, uh, uh, just like Terry did, uh, mine are more uh, on a telescope rig, but to kind of show like like what a what a good example of it is if you if you if you really get into astrophotography and also what an acceptable example is um, if uh, like for, from my earlier days of, of doing astrophotography just to kind of to kind of say like it doesn't have to be amazing it just has to be good <laughs> um, so here is a globular cluster. M13, uh, the uh, Hercules cluster, which uh, I'm sure every visual observer has seen and awed at. And uh, so when I, I, I mentioned earlier that I actually started with the Schmidt Cassegrain, which is a really hard place to start with astrophotography, but that's what I had available to me at the time. Taken with a dedicated astro camera on a high end mount in light polluted skies. But on the right is one I took with my DSLR on um, like a, well, a, a mount that I wouldn't say is high end, it's kind of medium, but it, it has its issues. Um, and, you know, this is a, a series of, oh, gosh, oh yeah, I was going to put how many exposures. I think, I think this is probably only like 20 or 30, like 30 second exposures. You know, you don't need to sit on a target for hours and hours, especially one like a globular cluster that's quite bright where actually I think lots of exposure time might actually make it worse. Um, but yeah, so it doesn't, doesn't need to be uh, really high quality, but uh, the, the program does lay out that the star should be not really bloated. It shouldn't have a whole lot of noise or uh, gradients or a lot of vignetting and stuff. So um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a reasonable image. Uh, another category for the deep sky area is galaxies. So um, on the left is one that I took at Deep Sky West on one of their super fancy like 14 inch plane wave corrected Dal Kirkums on their like really expensive Paramount Taurus with this really high end camera that I got a really epic image of. But you can do decently well with a Nikon or I, here I use my Nikon D5300 which is like a entry mid-ish level DSLR on a Lasmondi G11 with a a decent telescope. Uh, it's a neo-achromat, not an apo uh, telescope, where apochromatic refractors have uh, less chromatic aberration, but I still get reasonable images out of it with uh, with that telescope that's on that was on there. Molly, what galaxy was that? Oh, sorry, that was M33. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's on the bottom of the slide there, but yeah, I forgot to forgot to mention that. Um, so uh, dark nebulae. Now, uh, the Texas Star Party and going out to other dark sky sites are excellent places to take images of dark nebulae because you need to be able to see them against a background of, of brighter stars. And that's really hard to do from the city. Uh, picture here of the Snake Nebula, which by the way, I took with a DSLR and a less than $1,000 refractor telescope on a less than $1,000 mount when I was wow. at the Texas Star Party. Um, but over on the right, we have the Triffid Nebula, which uh, is actually a, a like many targets bang for your buck image. It has emission nebula, reflection nebula, dark nebula, and it's got an open cluster over there. I think that's, uh, what is that, M21, something like that, um, uh, if you take a wide enough field image of it through a refractor. So um, you can kind of, uh, you still have to have a minimum number of images, but you can tick off multiple boxes with, with one image as well. Uh, planetary nebula is one of the like uh, one of the optional categories to get your 25 deep sky images. From the city, I've been utilizing uh, a narrowband filters to be able to get a lot of so to be able to to get a lot of really awesome detail on this nebula. 
Um, but you don't have to go to that, that level of, of awesomeness. The one on the right is uh, a very much entry level camera on my eight inch McCassigan, which is also a really excellent planetary imaging scope on an all TAS mount. And this is probably like 10 or 12, 30 second exposures under mortal five skies. And yeah, it's definitely not the best image of the Dumbbell Nebula, but uh, the, this, I've got good, some good star color here. You can see the nebula. There's not a whole lot of noise. The stars look pretty nice. I had to delete a whole bunch of frames so the stars didn't track very well. Um, but there it is, the Dumbbell Nebula, which this is one of my first aster images and being able to see something like so much more on a given object than I could see with my eye was just the absolute coolest thing. Uh, yeah, so those are some examples of, of uh, deep sky targets and how it doesn't have to be a pod quality, but can instead just be decent. <laughs> All right, thank you, Molly. I appreciate that. And from you, we are going to go to Carl Wenning. Now, Carl is in his second term as chair of the North Central Region of the Astronomical League. He has been an amateur astronomer since being introduced to the sky by his grandfather during, uh, during yeah, July 1957. Today, he is an Astronomical League Master Observer. That means he has done a whole lot of observing programs. He would be one, if you had questions, he would probably have the answers. He has been involved in the Twin City Astronomers of Bloomington Normal, Illinois since September of 1978. He currently serves as the club's president, historian, and editor of the Observer Mag newsletter, which he received the AL Award in 2017, the Mabel Stearns Newsletter Editor Award. He continues to serve as sole Northern Lights Newsletter Editor. Carl was planetarium director from 1978 to 2000 and a physics educator from 1994 to 2008 at Illinois State University. He continues to teach physics education courses in retirement. So Carl, I'm gonna turn it over to you and thank you for being here. Hey, thank you, Jerry. Thank you for asking me. <clears throat> now, uh, let me get my little share started here. Uh, Terry asked me to uh, speak briefly about the North Central region of the Astronomical League. Uh, we are very active as far as that goes. Uh, it turns out that uh, we consist of seven states, as you see here in our little logo. Our uh, biggest states in terms of uh, participation are, of course, Minnesota, Iowa, uh, uh, Wisconsin, and Illinois. We only have one member uh, club up in North Dakota, none in South Dakota, and one up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Nonetheless, we're 32 active affiliates. We have annual conventions and, of course, statewide star parties in each of the states where we have a significant presence. Now, what I really want to talk about uh, today are some of the things that are a little bit more unique about the region. And uh, uh, from people looking at our region reports, which we give to the national office once a year, uh, people have said to me, why, you really have an active region. What are you doing? Uh, well, let's go ahead and talk about some of the things that we do. And uh, perhaps if other regions can uh, use this as an example, uh, that's terrific. Uh, again, you can contact me. My information is on the website that you see here. But you see our website uh, is maintained. It's got a tremendous amount of resources in it for any particular region. There's nothing special to our region here uh, in particular uh, that can't be modified to some other region. So uh, we have our listing of our officers, affiliates, the bylaws, the various things that I'm going to talk about here today as well. But uh, just for the re record, uh, our website is pretty simple. It's ncrowl.wordpress.com. And if you go there, you'll get this banner at the top of the page and you'll have all these pull down menus. So I want to do talk about this as well. Facebook, we're pretty active on Facebook. There's a few of us who uh, tend to contribute on a fairly daily basis or maybe sometimes as a couple of times a day. Uh, but here's a post here from just December 3rd, as you can see, the J Jupiter Saturn conjunction that a lot of people are talking about now. And it's uh, one way that we've uh, used to uh, keep in contact with our membership. We have 1,900 members spread out over you know, all these states in the upper uh, Midwest here. And it's really kind of hard to develop camaraderie, especially when you have to do things like cancel conventions like we had last year because of the, uh, the COVID. 
uh, but we're looking ahead and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But Facebook is something that we do uh, to keep our uh, people involved here. Uh, our newsletter seems to be the flagship of communication within the uh, region itself. Uh, the flagship uh, newsletter here, Northern Lights, is distributed quarterly, it goes out with each of the seasons or shortly thereafter, and it goes out through a mass emailing that we have. Uh, so members individually uh, subscribe to the uh, email list and that we send them communications such as the newsletter and other special updates from time to time. Now the newsletter is designed to not compete with commercial magazines such as Sky and Telescope or Astronomy. It's designed not to compete with Reflector. Uh, we have unique content things like chairs, messages, regional news, program reports. Uh, we do a profile on amateur astronomers nowadays, uh, observing accomplishments, seasonal updates for what to see in the sky and so on. And also what we do is uh, we have a series of usually a feature article or two, uh, typically three or four, but these are a few that I've written in the last couple of months from my perspective as a, as a, a leader in the educational and astronomical community. Uh, thoughts on making amateur astronomy uh, you know, better. Uh, the state of our astronomy clubs, healthier at risk, club leadership for our time. If there's a time now for leadership, this, this is it, because we're just now hopefully coming out of the pandemic. And I've, I've talked with several uh, distributors of astronomical equipment, and they tell me that they're being just lambasted with orders and questions and things like this. My impression is that there's a lot of people out there who now have some pent up demand. And uh, my belief is that you know, we need to get our regions, we need to get our affiliates, each of our own individual clubs uh, ready to, to, to provide the impulse, impetus that people need to get involved uh, with astronomy and our own clubs in our region. So uh, the newsletter is a great resource. It's typically 25 to 30 pages long, comes out again, like I say, quarterly. Uh, one of the things that's very unique is that uh, we've developed a grant program here. Uh, as a large region with 1900 members and 32 affiliates, we have a fairly good treasury. And when I was elected in 2017, I believe that, you know, here we are, we're sitting on over $10,000 and not doing anything with it. And I firmly believe that we should be using that to better amateur astronomy. And I also think that it's really nice because in our region, we have 32 little incubators. That is each of the affiliates, each of the clubs, can develop and present new things to help amateur astronomy. So in order to do this in 2019, the region approved two small mini grants, only $250 uh, each. Uh, one of them has to do with membership recruitment. So a club can apply for it, get the grant and use that money to build its own membership. And uh, the first grant went out in 2019. The club of 40 people got 32 new members. That's not a bad investment for $250. Uh, then there's an affiliate a recruitment grant as well uh, that went out this year, but unfortunately the pandemic has involved itself uh, with us. And so uh, it turns out that we, we might not get the things done this year, but we will continue with this project next year. But the idea is to recruit new affiliates for the Astronomical League and by default, the region. So uh, this is going to come, come on board here. We're looking at the Illinois State University Astronomy Club's active group of members on campus who had been doing little more than sitting around in the planetarium uh, thinking about how they might become amateur astronomers. And so uh, the Twin City Amateur Astronomers have taken them under their wings and are now teaching them how to do things like sidewalk observing, uh, which unfortunately has been put, put on hold now because of the pandemic. So if you'd like to see reports about these and some descriptions of them, please do check out our reports in the Northern Lights newsletter available through our website. We have awards, of course, all regions I suspect have awards. We have the major one here, the Region Award, which is conferred each year to a worthy candidate who has done a really good job promoting amateur astronomy uh, within the, either the community or the wider public. We have a newsletter editor award. We realize that newsletter editors do a tremendous amount of work, get very little uh, acknowledgement for it. Of course, we do get the national award, you know, uh, and I'm familiar with that, with having won it. But I still think there's people who do great jobs and, you know, they may not be up there in the ether uh, with the, some of the people who produce the greatest of, of, of uh, newsletters, but they're still quite good. And I think they need to be acknowledged. And of course, something we started here uh, a year ago uh, is the mini Messier Marathon Awards. 
Uh, these are typically observing programs with 27 or 28 seasonal Messier objects. And uh, people go out and observe them. And uh, if they get the 27 or 28 objects, they just check them off on the list. A lot of times people use go to, they're finished an hour, hour and a half. But I've gotten a tremendous amount of response from people saying, this is a great program. It gets people out to observe. And that's the idea behind it. It's not designed to compete with the, the ALs observing programs, which generally take months, if not sometimes years to complete. But uh, get them out there one night. And I've had a lot of commentary from people saying, yes, 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 this is wonderful. It gets us out to observe. This came from a, a discussion that we had as a part of the business meeting in 2017 up in Minnesota for our regional uh, meetings. And uh, we asked, how many of you have ever gotten a, a certificate or a pin from the Astronomical League? Only about 10% of the people there actually had. So we're trying to light some fires here. And then, of course, we have some of these wonderful resources out there. One of the things that we've put together here based upon many years of experience and then also some research uh, following up uh, several of our conventions with questionnaires, we put together a very extensive convention planning guide. And uh, it is only one of many, many different types of resources that you can find. And uh, if you want to see the convention planning guide, go to the NCRAW website. There's also something called the Twin City Amateur Astronomers Guides, uh, which is put together by our local club here. And uh, these are tremendous resources. The Introduction to Amateur Astronomy is a, like a 75 or 80 page booklet that we use for our Introduction to Amateur Astronomy course. And it's, it's, it's really right down there. I mean, what's a finder scope? What kind of amounts do they have? Why is my picture upside down in my, in my uh, telescope and so on? Astronomy is a hobby. People don't understand what hobbies are today, which is really unfortunate. The art of sky interpretation. If you ever want to know how to give sky lectures, by, by all means, please do it. I've been giving sky lectures for 40 years and uh, you know, I've shared some of my ideas here. So a lot of really helpful ones. Today, right now, very popular, it gets a lot of downloads is this one, buying binoculars and telescopes put together for the general public so they know what they need to know. Uh, so there's a lot of other things that uh, you can look at as well. Uh, and of course, uh, we have up here in the top center is some of the benefits of memberships that we use with other clubs to try to get them involved with our particular uh, region. So the state of the central region is, is good, you feel. The pandemic has caused a lot of uh, pent up interest that we want to take advantage of, and we're moving ahead in that particular realm. So if you think that uh, there's something that uh, NCRAL is doing here that uh, might be of interest to you, uh, please uh, let us know, and uh, we will be glad to share any details if you've got some questions for us. So that's all I've got for you. Terry, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Carl. You know, um, I chair the Great Lakes region and I look a lot at all the work you've done. You have done an amazing job. Your, your clubs, everything, your whole region is just amazing. Um, Thank you. You kind of make a guiding light for the rest of us to look at and say, okay, I could do that maybe too. So thank you for everything that you have done. Appreciate it. All right, Scott, how about if we go for a 10 minute break and we will come back and we're probably going to um, go to Shane right as we come back. And then I wanna go back to if all the observers, uh, Shailendra, uh, Simon and Howard are there and Molly, if you wanna join when um, Shane gets done, we might all hang out for a while and see what's going on in the sky. Okay. So 10 minute break. Here we go.
Is that you drinking your coffee there, Scott? Yes. Thought so. My juice, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see you got, uh, looks like you got a nice uh, image of the sun going on there. Yeah, seeing as rock solid all of a sudden. So I was like, I'm just hammering that record button right now. Good. I had a bit of a, an issue with the drive earlier on where all the data I captured earlier on isn't there. And I'm like, uh oh. No. That's terrible. Well, it's probably there. I just have to do some kind of recovery on the drive. Yeah. But um, I'm not wor really worried about it right now because my intent was not to image originally. Mm-hmm. Well, you never know when you might get that toothpaste squirting shot, you know? Well, I did. And uh, <laughs> technically, I might have lost it. Oh. oh no! No man! Terry, I want to tell you, it's a real honor to do this with the Astronomical League. So, very cool. Oh, Scott, we are so glad. Yeah. Well, we're happy to be I feel here. Like I'm in the, uh, you know, the the uh, working with in the big leagues now. <laughs> well, thank you. We really appreciate <laughs> you being here. Uh, we've done a lot with this global star parties, uh, and we've loved all of it. I mean, it's amazing so many people and see so many new things and to be able to do live view all over the world just amazes me yeah yeah the the um uh you know we've reached over well over a million people this year and wow. um, hundreds of thousands have watched the videos uh the video that we had um uh with mount wilson last night uh, continues to grow. That one, that one was really, that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, that was an amazing night. <laughs> yes, it was. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody ought to watch that video. It is incredible. I'm amazed they actually got as much as they got because of the Santa Ana winds, but they're so high up. Yeah. Well, we're back. Uh, uh, you are watching uh, the Astronomical League live and their special program of, of the Shaking Universe. Um, Terry Mann is um, Terry Mann is the uh, um, official host here uh, for this program, and what you're seeing right now live is the sun with uh, Simon Tang. Hello, hello, uh, hello. Yeah, we've actually caught ourselves in this um, rare minute where seeing is absolutely rock solid. Um, I don't know how well it comes across on your guys' screen right now, but I'm telling you now, it is not really moving. It is just unreal. Huh. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's really nice. I was wondering, what kind of uh, H-Alpha setup are you using? So this is a Quark uh, from Daystar Instruments, and I'm just using a 100 millimeter refractor. Okay. That's the beautiful. H-Alpha filter? Say again? The H-Alpha filter? Yes, this is a H-Alpha filter. Um, it's the Chronosphere yeah. version specifically. Thank you. That is amazing. Howard, we'll come back to you and Shailendra and Simon too and Molly if everybody wants to stick around after Shane gets done talking, we can all talk a little bit more and look a little bit more. So at this time, I would like to introduce Shane L. Larson. Uh, Shane is a research associate professor of physics at Northwestern University, where he is associate director of the Center for Interdisciplinary Exploration and Research in Astrophysics. He works in the field of gravitational wave astrophysics, specializing in studies of compact stars, binary, and the galaxy. He works in gravitational wave astronomy, 
with both the ground-based LIGO project and future space-based observatory LISA. He is an award-winning teacher and a fellow of the American Astronomical, I'm sorry, Astrophysical Society. He's an avid, avid astro or amateur astronomer observing with two home-built Dobsonians. One is a 12 and a half inch telescope named Equinox. The other is a 22 inch named Cosmos Mariner. He contributes regularly to science, to a science blog at science, right, right science wordpress.com and tweets with the handle at science Jedi. So I would like to introduce uh, Shane Larson. Howard, um, I'm not sure why your screen is staying on. There we go. Let's see is if we can do it to Shane. I think uh, Scott has it now. Is it okay now? Yeah, you're fine. There we go. There's right. Shane. <laughs> Right. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Terry and Scott, for hosting. Uh, I do want to thank uh, the Astronomical League for inviting me. Um, one of the great pleasures of my life is that I'm both a professional and an amateur astronomer. And so, uh, you know, I spend my days thinking about this stuff, but then I spend a lot of time out in the backyard with my telescope, uh, as many of you do. And so it's always a great pleasure to come talk to uh, amateur astronomers in particular about things that are very near and dear to my heart uh, professionally. And so uh, it's always a, a great opportunity to get an invitation. So, so thank you, Terry and, and Scott, for hosting. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about gravitational wave astronomy, which is what I do professionally. Um, in the background behind me here, this is an artist rendition of what the LISA spacecraft will look like. Um, next to me right now in the image, it's probably about life size. The full spacecraft will be about two meters across from one side to the other. It has two eight inch telescopes uh, that they might be 12 inch by the time we're done, but right now eight inch telescopes uh, that shine lasers back and forth uh, to other identical spacecraft uh, that are about two and a half million kilometers separated from this. And we use that technology to detect gravitational waves. And that's the future of gravitational wave astronomy that I'm gonna talk to you about today. Okay, so let me share a few slides here. Um, can you all see my slides? Yep. Okay, perfect. So uh, gravitational wave astronomy is brand new way of doing astronomy. It's literally only five years old, though the endeavor to bring it to fruition is a 70 plus year effort uh, that has been ongoing since the middle of the 20th century. Uh, I'm at uh, Sierra, which is our interdisciplinary center for astrophysics at Northwestern. And gravitational wave astronomy, more than almost any other branch of astronomy that I can think of, truly is interdisciplinary. It requires, without fail, engineers and computer scientists and data scientists and uh, relativists and physicists in order to actually make the missions work. And so it's a very invigorating field to be involved in. It's very um, rewarding in terms of the kinds of science we do and the boundaries that we're pushing in terms of what we understand about the universe and both in terms of what we're able uh, to measure about the universe. And so I hope to give you a little bit of that story um, today in this short talk that I'm going to give you. Uh, there's a link to my uh, blog. It is a public science blog, as I like to tell people. It's there so my mom knows what I do. My mom is a forester. My dad's a biologist. Um, and so I talk about astronomy and all sorts of things there. And of course, you can certainly follow me on uh, social media. So for almost 400 years since the invention of the telescope, uh, we as amateur astronomers, like professionals, have accessed the universe with this kind of technology. So these are my two telescopes uh, that Terry mentioned. That's Equinox on the left and Mariner on the right. We gather all of our knowledge, almost all of our knowledge, about the universe by the collection of photons. And almost everything that you read about in astronomy magazines or news articles or astronomy textbooks has really been learned, gleaned by the reception and the interpretation of light itself in all its myriad forms. And what we are at the cusp of right now is the beginning of a new era. 
Um, professional astronomers are scattered around the world, just like amateur astronomers, but networked in that distribution of astronomers is this new network of technological observatories called gravitational wave observatories. There are five active ones, and this map is already out of date, uh, but uh, there are five active ones. The ones here in the United States are called LIGO. Uh, there's one in Hanford, Washington, one in Livingston, Louisiana. In Europe, uh, the large one is called Virgo outside of Pisa, Italy. There's a small 700 meter one, 600 meter one in Germany called GEO. And the Japanese just brought Kagura online uh, here uh, this year. And so Kagura is now actively uh, operating with us. Uh, a third LIGO is being built in India, and that should be online in the next two, three, four, five years, something like that. There additionally are radio astronomers around the world at parks uh, in Europe and in the United States, both at Green Bank and at, uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, which use uh, radio astronomy to do gravitational wave observations. Uh, there's an entire group, uh, many experiments at the South Pole, which are observing the microwave background in order to do gravitational wave astronomy. And I'm gonna talk about LISA for the most part, which is an orbiting uh, uh, satellite, trio of satellites that will work together as a single gravitational wave observatory. So to talk about what this whole network's about and the, the place that LISA holds in it, I wanna start with a, a story, which some of you may know from electromagnetic astronomy that I call the spectrum parable. So this is a very famous thing that William Herschel uh, discovered in the 1800s. Uh, we were beginning to understand light and try and understand what its properties were. And Herschel had developed this experiment where he would take a set of thermometers and was placing them in the different color bands of the spectrum in order to understand whether or not all the different colors of light were the same. Okay, and as the story goes, he accidentally left one of the thermometers just outside uh, the range of red light in the spectrum, and he noticed that the thermometer was increasing in temperature. And so he developed a little bit more sophisticated measurements, and he discovered that well outside the boundaries of what you and I call visible light, he could detect that there was energy coming through the spectrum. So this was the discovery of infrared light. And at that time, we had absolutely no technology to use anything, uh, any wavelength of light for astronomy except the telescope. So visible, visible astronomy was all we had, but here Herschel had discovered that there was light our eyes couldn't see and that our instruments couldn't collect that we could possibly use for astronomical purposes. And this is very typical of the way that science works. We make some fundamental discovery about the universe. We barely understand that discovery at the moment we make it, the idea that there's light our eyes can't see, but then it takes time for technology and engineering and creativity to catch up before we actually utilize that knowledge for some other purpose. And indeed, what most of you know, uh, uh, that did indeed happen. The electromagnetic spectrum, as we know now, is quite wide. It spans well above the blue range of light and well below the red range of light. The different parts of the spectrum have the names you see there through the middle, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, microwave, and radio waves. Um, the figures there underneath the names are common objects that you may be familiar with, which have the approximate same size as the wavelength of the color of light in that part of the spectrum, okay? But the red line there shows that the property of light, the physical property of the light that we measure, the wavelength, changes as you go across the spectrum, which is why our technology had to catch up in order to be able to respond or collect or measure each of those different uh, wavelengths of light. But indeed it did catch up and much of the story of the history of the development of astronomical technology in the 20th century is building instruments, technological pieces of equipment that were capable of measuring the light in each one of these parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And as it turns out, every single one of those bands is useful for astronomy. So there's many images which you may have seen over your life that show this is true, but this is one of my favorites. So this is the antenna galaxies in Corvus, which some of you may have seen in your telescope, the optical image is down there uh, in the center. Uh, so this is two colliding galaxies. They are, uh, their cores are slowly uh, merging there in the center, but they're leaving behind them these long tidal tails as we call them, which are streams of stars and gas that are being left apart and distorted by the gravitational interaction of the galaxies. Uh, 
What we've discovered is when you take an astronomical object, you may be able to see and understand what's going on from a single image, like the optical image. But if you look in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, different colors of light, different wavelengths of light, then you discover that different physical processes are illuminated. In the radio and the infrared, you can study uh, gas and dust and its thermal properties. In the optical, you see stars and their luminous properties. If you go up into the x-rays, you see high energy processes where gases are becoming very energetic and very hot. Okay, And so together with all of these measurements of this single object, we can construct a story about what the past history of the galaxies was, what the future history of them might be, and indeed what is going on with them right now. The whole picture, or at least more of the whole picture, is obtained by gathering more data and more information, which of course is the way science works. Limited data tells you something, you can speculate all you want about what might be going on and why, but the only way to answer the big questions that come up is to gather more data. And using different colors of light is one way of doing that. Of course, I don't work in optical astronomy or electromagnetic astronomy. I work in gravitational wave astronomy. And so gravitational waves are something Einstein predicted in 1916, just a year after he first published General Relativity. But he had deduced that gravity, like everything else in the universe, has to obey the ultimate speed limit. It cannot propagate faster than the speed of light. And so that means that when two objects are moving and changing the way they influence the gravitational forces in the area around them, that information about the changes must propagate away from them and be obtainable by distant observers in other parts of the universe. But that information has to travel slower than the speed of light. And so that propagating information is indeed what we call gravitational waves. This is a particular visualization of gravitational waves that I like from my colleagues at Goddard uh, Space Flight Center. Uh, you saw another one that Scott was playing at the beginning of the live stream uh, from the LIGO collaboration. This one I like in particular. It's two black holes that are slowly spiraling together and merging. Uh, the bright points that you see in the movie are the wave fronts of the gravitational waves. But what you should notice from this movie are two things. One is the uh, waves propagate in every direction from the two black holes. And that's really why this is useful for astronomy. It means you can be anywhere in the universe and the gravitational waves from this event will eventually reach you. So we standing here on Earth will see gravitational waves from this, but our counterpart astronomers orbiting some planet in around some star in Ursa Major, they will also see the gravitational waves from this event as they merge. The other thing you should notice is the brightness of the lines that you see corresponds to the intensity of the waves. So uh, this particular event is a merger where the two black holes coming together. It's initially kind of dim, but then it gets very bright and then it gets dim again. So these events can indeed be transient in the same way that electromagnetic events can be transient. We have this enormous burst of gravitational energy, the merger event. It goes off and it's very bright and detectable, but then it slowly fades away. And so just like in electromagnetic astronomy, where you're looking for supernovae or gamma ray bursts or any kind of transient event, if you're not looking, you're not going to see it. OK, but uh, as uh, as we've discovered over the last five years, the universe is very active and these things are popping off all the time. And so this is certainly a way uh, to to learn and observe the universe. So the reason I told you the parable of the spectrum is that there is equivalently a spectrum in gravitational waves. And so this is uh, a representation of the spectrum. It's been cleverly color coded to go from short wavelengths on the purple end to long wavelengths on the red end, which is the normal tendency in color in the electromagnetic spectrum. But gravitational waves don't necessarily have color, but it helps with your visual uh, interpretation if we do it that way. The lower line there lists the frequency. So those of you who remember your physics classes may remember that you can describe waves in terms of one of two numbers, their wavelength or their frequency. The frequency is basically how many peaks of the wave go by you each second that goes on. 
Um, gravitational wave astronomers favor frequencies, so almost all of us use frequencies. But if you want to think about that in terms of astronomy, I like the top row, which is if you take the inverse of the frequency, one divided by the frequency number, it gives you some time scales there, milliseconds, seconds, hours, years, or the age of the cosmos. And what those time scales are is the time scale over which an object is changing its dynamic configuration, the period of an orbit, how rapidly something falls into a black hole, things like that. So the astrophysical time scale of the object basically tells you very roughly what the frequency of the gravitational waves that you might be able to observe that object in. Okay. The little boxes then are the places where we have exquisite and developing technology to measure gravitational waves. Unlike electromagnetic astronomy, where it took us almost a century, starting with you know radio telescopes with uh, Grote Reber and Carl Jansky in the 1930s, to the development of X-ray telescopes and infrared telescopes in the 1970s, gravitational wave astronomy is kind of coming online all at once across the entire spectrum. And we have good technology uh, to monitor gravitational waves in the cosmic microwave background using radio astronomy monitoring of pulsars uh, with our ground-based observatories like LIGO, that's LIGO there in the lower right, um, or in space. And space is where I, uh, I do most of my work. Okay, But the beauty of the spectrum and the reason it's so interesting to us as astronomers is that when you look across the spectrum, there are sources of gravitational waves in every part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so these are all things that we know exist. There are certainly plenty of things that may not exist, that we speculate may exist, but there's plenty of things that we do know should exist. And so this is why we're so excited and why we're so energetic about gravitational wave astronomy is there's a lot to learn about with gravitational wave astronomy. And just like the example with the antennae galaxies, if we can add gravitational wave astronomy to our toolbox, add all of that knowledge to our encyclopedia entry about all of these things that we might observe, it will only enhance our understanding of what these astrophysical phenomena are. So you've probably heard a lot about LIGO if you've been following gravitational wave astronomy at all. So that's this uh, purple band over here. Uh, we see uh, if, they, if they happen nearby, uh, we'll see explosions of stars, supernovas. Uh, we see binary mergers, the merging of black holes, the neutron stars, and a variety of other sources. But LISA, which is in this blue band, you'll see it has a robust, a plethora of sources that we uh, hope to be able to observe. Many of these are known. They're already observed with the electromagnetic telescopes. And so we, we absolutely know we'll see them with LISA and we will just enhance our knowledge of each of these sources. But let me tell you a little bit about LISA. So as I said at the beginning, LISA is three spacecraft. You can see them there in the lower left of the image. Each one of them is identical to the others and they shine lasers back and forth between them. Okay, so it takes about eight and a half seconds for the laser light to fly from one spacecraft to the other. Um, but you can think of it, if you just cover up one of the laser beams, it will look very similar to you, uh, to LIGO. So if you've studied LIGO or if you've heard talks about LIGO, it kind of works the same way LIGO does. A little different because we're in space. But, but it's still a laser measurement to detect gravitational waves. And the way we make the measurement is we time how long it takes the laser to fly to one spacecraft or the other. And when the gravitational waves pass through the Earth, uh, through the solar system, uh, they will change the length of time it takes that laser to fly back and forth between the spacecraft. It is in orbit around the sun, which you can see there. And I have a movie. Yes, I have a movie that shows that. Uh, nope, I don't. I thought I had a movie that shows that. I'm sorry about that. Uh, it orbits uh, around the sun. It follows the Earth. Uh, so it'll be behind the Earth in this triangular configuration that it maintains uh, for about 10 years or more. Okay? So the source is, the difference between LIGO and LISA is just like the difference between electromagnetic uh, infrared observations or electromagnetic ultraviolet observations. You're looking at different parts of the gravitational wave spectrum. And the consequence of that is that you see different astrophysical phenomena. So for LIGO, we see small systems that are fast. And what I mean by fast is I mean the time scale over which the astrophysics happens is very short, fractions of a second. 
So these are things like neutron stars colliding, small black holes colliding, where by small, I mean stellar mass black holes, or things like supernovae. Things that happen just almost instantly, and then they're done. By contrast, Lisa sees what we call big, slow systems. And what we mean by slow is systems that have changes to their astrophysical configuration on the scale of tens of seconds all the way up to the scale of a day or so. And so that could be uh, ultra compact binaries, as we call them, over there on the left, two white dwarfs orbiting around each other. It could be supermassive black holes there in the center, at the centers of galaxies. When galaxies like the antenna galaxies collide, their black holes find each other and eventually merge. And when they do, they'll be in the least band. They take kind of hours to orbit each other. And then lastly, uh, some of you may recognize uh, there on the right, that is small stars going around big black holes or falling into black holes. Yeah. Whoa, big noise there. Uh, those of you who pay attention, uh, Nobel Prizes uh, will recognize that this is uh, the center of our own Milky Way galaxy where the group from UCLA and the group from Germany have been observing stars orbiting the big black hole uh, for 10, 15, 20 years now and can actually see the stars complete orbits around the black hole. And if those stars get close enough to the black hole, then Lisa will be able to detect them in gravitational waves. Okay? So let's, oh, there's my movie. That's the movie. I guess I had my slides out of order. So this is a movie showing that Lisa will follow the Earth around its orbit. You can see there that it's a, a triangle. It maintains that configuration, uh, but it kind of does this slow reverse cartwheel, uh, as we say, as it goes around uh, its orbit around the sun. So what sorts of things might Lisa see? So let me tell you a little bit about that, uh, and we'll get to the end here. So one of, one of the most important sources, and the one that most of my professional astronomy colleagues are excited about, is the possibility that Lisa will observe merging massive black holes. So just like the antenna galaxies uh, were merging, we see merging galaxies throughout the universe in many configurations. Those of you who are astrophotographer imagers may have taken pictures of some of these yourself, but this is just a collection from Hubble. Uh, what we know, what we've learned in just the time since I've been uh, a professional astronomer is that most big galaxies, most big spiral galaxies, like the one you see there in the lower right, if they have a prominent bulge, that usually means they have a big, massive black hole. Okay, so typically millions or tens of millions of solar masses. That means when the galaxies merge and become a single new galaxy, all the stars become a giant collection of the new galaxy, typically an elliptical galaxy. But the black holes, being the heaviest things in the system, tend to sink down towards the center. And when they sink down towards the center, eventually they find each other, they spiral around each other, and they merge. And the, the consequence of that merger is they emit gravitational waves that we can see with LISA. Now, the reason that's interesting is because one of the great mysteries in modern astrophysics is how do big black holes grow? How do they get to be the size they are? And why do we see so many of one size versus so many of another size. And so part of answering that question is recognizing how do galaxies grow and how do black holes become associated with galaxies. But another part of that is what happens when galaxies collide and how often do the black holes find each other and what do they eat along the way? Okay, so this is part of that story. And so Lisa will provide a direct measurement, a way of understanding how over the long course of their lives, galaxies assemble with other galaxies, their black holes find each other and they merge. Okay, now one of the problems that I have as a gravitational wave astronomer is that I can show you pretty pictures like this. All of us have grown up during the age of Hubble and we're used to seeing pretty pictures like this. But in gravitational wave astronomy, this is a measurement of the universe that our biological senses are not designed to deal with. So when I make a detection, the thing that I've measured is really best represented as a graph. But if I send that graph to the editor at the Chicago Tribune, they're like, go away, kid, you bother us. They want pictures of Hubble, just like you and I are used to seeing, because that's the way they're used to experiencing and interfacing uh, with the world of astronomy. But one of the things we can do is we can take our data, 
our waves, our gravitational wave signals. And one of the things you probably remember from your science class is that there are many kinds of waves in the universe. You probably learned about water waves and sound waves and light waves and waves on a string. But the truth is waves are waves are waves. They're all mathematically described in exactly the same way. And so one of the most beautiful things is that if I take some waves and represent it mathematically and I put it on your cell phone, when it comes out the headphone jack, you get Katy Perry or Led Zeppelin or the Glenn Miller Band or whatever it is you listen to on your phone when you're listening to music. But if I steal your phone and replace those mathematical wiggles on your phone with gravitational waves, then when it pushes that wiggle out through your headphone jack, you won't hear Katy Perry, you'll hear an audio representation of the gravitational waves. And so this is one of the ways we like to help people understand that there's real astrophysical content in the gravitational waves. So I think this will work over Zoom. So let me do this for you, a demonstration here. Let me just play two sounds for you. So these are uh, the kinds of things we expect to be able to observe with Lisa. This is a 10 solar mass black hole falling into a 10,000 solar mass black hole. And as it does, it will change the gravitational configuration of space and time around it. It will create gravitational waves, which will propagate across the universe and that we can then detect. And so as I'm a theoretician, that means I do a lot of math with my fountain pen and my computer. So I can calculate what that wave looks like. And so I've just taken those wiggles and I've just pushed them out through an audio generator like the one on your phone. Okay, so I'm going to play you this gravitational wave signal. 10 solar mass black hole falling into 10,000 solar mass black hole twice. But the first time I'm going to do it with orbits that are circles that are shrinking to smaller circles. And the second time I'm going to play it with orbits that are eccentric. They're elliptical or oval shaped. Okay. And what, and that's the only difference between these two signals. And the point is, is that your ear is very good at hearing those differences. You don't have to have a PhD in physics and, you know, take five years of tensor calculus and steady gravitational waves to hear it. Your ear is perfectly capable of making that measurement. Okay, so I'm going to play those two for you. So did you hear that? Could you hear that? I don't know if that's a plane over Zoom or it's not. pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's the famous chirp. So what's happening? When the orbit's big, the, low, the, the sound is low pitched. But as the orbit gets smaller, it's going faster and faster and faster. And so the, the sound gets higher pitched. And then when they merge and they become one black hole, the gravitational waves are over. So it chirps and it ends. Okay. Here's the exact same system, except... I made the orbits oval shaped. Sounds like your car, right? <laughs> My old car. Your old car. So what's happening there is that when you're on an elliptical orbit, sometimes the two black holes are close and sometimes they're far away. And so when they're close, the gravity is very strong and you hear a pop. But when they're far away, the gravity is weaker and you hear that gap between the pops. But as the orbit shrinks and they get closer and closer together, the pops happen more frequently, more frequently, and it begins to sound like the first one that you heard. Okay, so by making a measurement like this, Lisa would be able to tell us that orbit was circular and that orbit was elliptical, which tells us something about the history, the evolutionary history of the black holes before they got to that point where they were going to merge. 
Now, what we spend a lot of time studying in my group are what we call ultra compact binaries. So those of you who are uh, double star observers will know that stars sometimes orbit each other the way the moon orbits the earth or planets orbit the sun. But that process happens very slow. If you want to actually see a star move in its orbit, it's kind of a multi-year endeavor. So I've been watching Gamma Virginis for, uh, what, 10 years now, trying to see it move in the sky, okay? But ultra compact binaries, like those yellow ones swirling around right there, they orbit everyone, uh, each other once every 16 minutes, right? So these are two objects, the masses of stars, white dwarfs, going around each other once every 16 minutes, okay? So these are called the ultra compact binaries. And in the Milky Way galaxy alone, there are between 10 and 50 million of them. Okay, this is the stellar graveyard of the Milky Way. And everyone that's in the Milky Way will emit gravitational waves that Lisa is sensitive to. There are so many that most of what we detect in gravitational waves is going to be what we call confusion. It's like all sitting together at dinner time at a star party, everyone's talking and laughing and telling jokes about eyepieces, and you can't hear anything but the whole hubbub of everything of everyone talking, okay? But what you can hear are the really loud people talking really loud, or you can hear the people that are close to you. And this will be the case of the Milky Way galaxy. The 10 million ultra compact binaries will be all confused, but there will be between 10 and 30,000 individual ones that are loud or close enough that we can pick them out of the hubbub of the galaxy. So this is what we do in my group. We simulate the entire galaxy on the computer to represent that. Uh, this is a movie from my colleague Tyson Littenberg zooming out from the sun, showing the detectable, the 30,000 or so LISA detectable sources. Uh, so as you zoom out, you'll see every dot that appears is a uh, white dwarf binary that we will be able to detect with LISA. You can see they trace out the entire shape of the Milky Way galaxy. The black ones are mm. ones that we already know of. We see them in telescopes and we study them all the time. The purple ones compared to the red ones are ones that will be detectable both with LISA and telescopes. And that's a notable population for us as amateur astronomers because many of these are accessible to those of us with uh, imaging and photometry technology in our backyard. Uh, in fact, there's a, one of those black dots is a very famous star called AMCVN. Uh, it's a variable with a 1,028 second period. The only reason we know the period of AMCVN is because of the observations of the amateurs. The period of AMCVN was unknown for a long period of time, uh, but a group of amateurs called the Center for Backyard Astrophysics uh, worked it out in the mid-1990s, and so we know the exact period of AMCVN now and know that it will be a very strong LISA source. So there's some interesting work for amateurs who are interested in science uh, overlap to uh, work on uh, ultra-compact binaries uh, in the LISA overlap realm. Another thing that we do is uh, we don't actually know what all the properties of the Milky Way are. And so in my group, one of the things we do is we're changing our computer simulations. We say, okay, how well do we know the distribution of stars in the Milky Way? You know, we have a number we teach you when you take Astro 101, but there's error bars on that uh, number because some measurements are good and some measurements are bad, some measurements are hard, right? And so we just don't know the number precisely. Um, there are other things like uh, there's a number astronomers use called metallicity, which is what's the relative chemical balance of chemical elements in the Milky Way. And it varies across the galaxy and it's uncertain in parts of the galaxy. So we vary all of those numbers and then we re-simulate the galaxy to ask how will Lisa's perception, Lisa's measurement of the Milky Way change if the galaxy was one way versus another way? Basically, we're trying to say, how will Lisa be able to tell us what the properties of the Milky Way actually are? So this is a pair of galaxies where we've done exactly that. And the difference you should notice between them is we've changed the properties of the Milky Way bulge. And so if you look, Lisa's view of the bulge in the galaxy on the left is it's a much smaller, much thinner bulge. But if you look at the uh, Milky Way on the right, the bulge is a bit thicker and a bit fatter. Okay, and so that has to do with the stellar evolutionary history of the bulge and the way the stellar graveyard has evolved over the entire history of the Milky Way. 
okay? So that's the kind of stuff that uh, we do in uh, our group. So there's, there's a whole bunch of things that Lisa will observe like the black holes or like the uh, ultra compact binaries. And so one of the things that uh, we've done with that audio thing is unlike LIGO or unlike supernova searches or other things that you're used to in astronomy, we're not just sitting around waiting for these things to happen. For Lisa, this stuff is on all the time, just like being in that lunchroom. No, it never gets quiet. Everyone's just talking the whole time. Okay, and so what we've done is we've poured all that simulation together and we've made another audio file of the entire gravitational universe playing simultaneously all the same time. Okay, so this one's a little bit quieter. I hope you can hear it, but let me go ahead and play it. What you'll hear is uh, black holes merging. You'll hear the galaxy. You'll hear small things falling into the black holes. A whole bunch of different things all overlap together. And our job as gravitational wave astronomers is to dissect this total signal in order to determine what each of those individual things is. So let me play that for you and then we'll wrap up. That was a black hole merging in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be this constant cacophony of signals. And what my colleagues and I spend lots of time worrying about right now is how do you actually extract that cacophony? How do you get actual astrophysical information um, from it? And as it turns out, there's been a lot of work done uh, on this uh, question. Uh, in particular, uh, the separation of large overlapping signals has been worked on by the telecommunications industry. How do you separate 10 million uh, text messages from high schoolers around the world? Well, that's the same problem as separating 10 million gravitational wave signals uh, from each other in the LISA data. So, and there's one more big black hole in there. Okay. Okay. So... My last message for all of you is that science, like most things, just like amateur astronomy, as we've heard all day today, is really a community endeavor. The scientists around the world are constantly working on this together. There are folks who are engineers, folks who are teaching in classrooms, folks who are sitting in the Mission Operations Center, folks who are building the satellites, folks like me who are sitting on computers analyzing data. And we really can't do anything we do without all of these people involved. It is a national endeavor, certainly, but it is absolutely, for this kind of astronomy, a worldwide international endeavor. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't notice that that wasn't true as well. I've been mentioning my group all along, so these are the folks I work with. Uh, my uh, closest faculty collaborators are across the top there, uh, but the, the group of young folks you see there at the bottom, those are all the students who are currently doing their, uh, their undergraduate and their graduate work with me uh, in my group at Northwestern. So uh, all of them uh, are going to be standing where I'm standing in 20 years, giving you the talk about all the things that Lisa has uh, definitely discovered. So. So I always like to leave you with a few things to read. Uh, here's a couple of books. Uh, if you're interested in the history of uh, the building of LIGO, uh, this is a very great book by Marsha Bartusiak called Einstein's Unfinished Symphony. Uh, mm -hmm. She won a great science writing award by, uh, on this. Uh, Marsha is an excellent science, uh, uh, science author for those of you who read public science books. Uh, she writes really great books. But this one in particular um, is just about gravitational waves. There are two editions of the book. So if you get the second edition of the book, it will be after the first discovery. Uh, but if you get the first edition of the book, then she's talking about the lead up to the construction of LIGO. Uh, the middle book there is a, is a recent book by Brian Clegg, uh, who's a famous science writer. I think he's probably more famous in Europe than he is here in the United States. Uh, but uh, it's specifically focused on gravitational waves. And so it's a very nice public level book just about all the sorts of stuff. Uh, that gravitational waves can teach us. And then the last book is uh, also won a very famous science uh, award. Uh, it was written by Kip Thorne, who was one of the Nobel Prize winners for the gravitational wave discovery. It's called Black Holes and Time Warps. It's kind of more broad than just gravitational waves, but if you're interested in relativity, uh, black holes, wormholes, uh, all of that sort of stuff, as well as gravitational waves, it's a, it's a great book uh, to pick up. 
Uh, down there in the lower left, this is a citizen science project that uh, we at Northwestern uh, have developed with our colleagues at Adler um, and the Zooniverse. It's called Gravity Spy. Uh, that image you see there is uh, one of the ways that we represent our data visually. It's called a spectrogram. Uh, and different sources have different spectrograms. And so the way the Citizen Science Project works is we show you different spectrograms and ask you to classify them. Uh, so you can do it on your phone in the after time when we all can commute again uh, while you're sitting around instead of binge watching uh, Netflix or something. You can certainly do gravity spike classifications for us. Uh, but basically what we do is we take all the classifications that you do. We take them back to the computer and we say, see this? This is not gravitational waves, and this is gravitational waves, right? So we're using your power of pattern recognition as a human to teach computers to not be dumb. Uh, and it makes our, our, our analysis life uh, a lot easier. So we've had, uh, I don't know, quarter of a million people uh, working with us on that and something like two, two million classifications done. And it, it really is a, a, a really neat project. Um, people, people participate in all kinds of different Zooniverse projects, uh, but this is our, our gravitational wave one. Uh, and then lastly, there's a series of links there uh, to various sites related to gravitational waves, including uh, the ones to my blog. And I'm going to end there and say thank you so much for your attention. I hope you all are staying safe and well and have a great weekend. Thank you, Shane. That, that was an amazing talk. Do you have time for a few questions? Yes, I can take questions. Absolutely. Okay, Scott, do you want to read the yep. ones in chat? Sure. Um, one of the questions is, uh, do the gravitational waves affect regular light? Several wavelengths coming from stars, like it affects laser beam, like it affects the laser beams, which is only one wavelength. Yeah, so that's a great question. So this is a question that, that we often get in the context of the detectors uh, because the detectors are a type of scientific instrument called an interferometer. And those of you who remember your physics uh, training, you remember that interferometers are often taught to you in terms of wavelengths of light sitting inside the detector perfectly. And so the question is, well, do the gravitational waves stretch the light or not? So the gravitational waves are stretching space and time, not the phenomena that exist in space and time. Um, the effect is so tiny that um, in order to detect it, you need very large distances to measure it, which is why LIGO is four kilometers long and LISA is two and a half million kilometers long. But the wavelengths of light are billionths of a meter long. And so the fractional distance that the gravitational wave would stretch a, a wavelength of light is so small that it's not detectable by any technology that we have today. Wow, okay. Uh, That's a good question. Yeah. That's a hard That's a question. question. <laughs> Great answer. Uh, another question. Um, uh, will will uh, we be able to determine the direction of the gravitational waves? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, when I first showed that network map of the gravitational wave detectors across the world, this is one of the reasons we need multiple detectors on Earth is because the multiple detectors are spread around and the gravitational waves when they pass by they get to one detector first and another detector second and another detector third and that allows us to triangulate where on the sky the source actually came from with lisa you'll remember i said the sources are on the whole time and so as lisa goes around the sun at one point in time it hears the source in a certain direction, but as it changes its profile, as it goes around the sun, it can kind of tell it's coming from a different direction related to Lisa itself. Mm -hmm. So this is very similar to the way your ears work. You have two ears. And so if you walk around a room, you can kind of tell with your eyes closed, you can tell where someone is sitting based on the fact that it sounds different depending on where you are in the room. Right. Okay. And I think that, I think that also answers Chuck Allen's question of how does Lisa triangulate the location of gravity waves, sources, or events? So I think, I think you clearly uh, answered that. Um, let's see if there's any other questions here. Uh, yes. Aside from the black hole mergers, the white noise. Oh, okay. No, they're just making a comment here about uh, the white noise here. Um, Shane, uh, another question, if Shane was working on E-Lisa time, 
I don't know. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> Anyways, um, they they love the presentation. Uh, they uh, this is really uh, uh, tough physics, and I was able to grasp it. Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs> You know, um, once, Shane, I, I was able to sit in and listen to uh, Stephen Hawking give a lecture at Caltech, and I th I'm not a physicist and, and um, don't pretend to be, um, but I wanted to sit down and be in the environment. I wanted to just kind of soak it in somehow, and I was so surprised at how uh, Stephen Hawking could take the most complex concepts and reduce it down to explain it so that really anybody could understand it. And yeah. <laughs> um, there was a, uh, he, he answered questions. You've probably seen him give lectures, but he answered a, um, questions from uh, undergraduates at Caltech. And most of them were pretty straightforward and he answered them. And then they got to this one question. This question must have been two pages long, okay? <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> Basically, he said, let me just let me just bring this down here. It was something like that. I'm paraphrasing. But he said, what this guy's really asking is this. And what the answer is, is that. OK. And he said, if you don't know how to ask the question, you don't really understand it. OK. You know, so. So it was. Yeah, people, uh, people often ask me, they're like, you know, how is this going to be useful? Right. You know, how is discovering something about black holes? Sure. And, and my answer to them is actually that same answer. Right. We barely understand what we just discovered. Right? And so we can't even possibly imagine how to use this knowledge to improve your golf game or make your life in the kitchen better or help orphans or whatever people want to do with with science and technology. And so so that that notion that that knowledge is uncertain and that we're uncertain about what we know and don't know and even how to ask questions, let alone them answer, it is kind of at the heart of how all this science at this level works. And so it just takes time, right? Yeah. Well, let's just take away all the science that was ever done ever. And what would their life be like? <laughs> you know, we would still be working on clay tablets. In ways that we don't even realize, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That was wonderful, Shane. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Shane. We sure do appreciate it. All right. How about if we take about a 10 minute break and we will come back with um, any astrophotographers that are still there. I see Simon Tang is still there. Um, Molly's probably here. Anyway, we'll come back and speak with them. And Shane, again, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. That was a fantastic talk. It's my pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go to a 10 minute break. Yeah, if anybody, back. if everybody wants to just see what everyone's looking at that's still left on the program, please stick around. Terry? Yeah. Um, I, I have about three images that might be worthwhile. One's showing solar minimum versus solar maximum, and then comparing solar maximum with our current status two days ago. And there's some interesting, it'd take me about two, three minutes just to kind of describe the differences. No problem, that is Howard, right? This is Howard, yeah. Yeah, okay. We'll go to you first then. Oh, okay. Is that okay? Sounds great, thank Okay, you. we'll come to you right after the break. Okay. So Terry, I'm gonna sign off. Okay, thank you again, Shane. I really appreciate it, I love the talk. That was amazing. Oh. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And I do appreciate the invitation. If no one invites us, we'd never get to talk about these things. So uh, <laughs> thanks so much. Right? All done, Shane. Do it again thank sometime. You. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. Okay. Take care. Thanks, thank Scott, you. if you're still there. Yeah, thank you, Shane. Thank you. It was wonderful. Okay. Nice to meet everybody. I hope I see you all again soon. <laughs> I'll see you now. Count on it. <laughs> okay. There you go. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. I'm about to lose the sun behind my roof, so I'm going to do something different. Okay. Um, have to Is that reset. Like prominence? Yeah, there's a little prominence sticking out. In fact, let me just so you guys can see it. There is other prominences. That's the only one of any major interest. And then there's one. Well, I'd say there's 
interest, but this one's too faint, but you can pick it up. Yeah. Wow. And whistling around on the other side, there's this guy. Oh, wow. Going a bit too fast. And then there's a tiny one there. And seeing just got really good all of a sudden. <laughs> there's another one right there. Yeah, there's a there's a bunch of them scattered all over the place. That's I always like to look at prominences. Those look pretty cool. Um, are will you have anything still available as we come out of break? Or um, so I'm actually going to capture this real fast because it's clear. Um, okay. I'm actually going to try and find Jupiter and Saturn. Oh great! I know okay. it sounds insane because it's actually <laughs> one thirty six. The only thing here is though. Um, I don't know if the glare is that severe because it's far enough apart from the sun for me to try and find it. Okay. Um, but whether or not we'll see it is another story. Okay. May I be able to? I've imaged Venus while the sun was up and while it was only a few degrees from the sun. Well, um, v Venus is a lot easier, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot brighter, so I, I, it's going to take me a second to find it because I have nothing to go against. Okay. okay. Well, we'll come back to Howard, then we'll come over to you. Okay, so fingers crossed I can find it. Okay, sounds great. Right, I've got to reset this, so I'm going to get off the uh, headphone for a second. Okay. Shailendra, are you still there? Hey Terry, yeah, oh, still okay. here. Okay, I'm well, checking gonna, the sky. Okay, hang in there if you can. We're gonna do a couple looks with Howard and Simon, and then we'll check with you if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I mean, I'm clouded out. I've got tiny bits, but nothing really outstanding, or well, you can't can really even see the nebula, really. Yeah, I can show you some pictures. Yeah. Yeah. If you're clouded out, feel free to do that. Brilliant. Cheers. Okay. Thank you. Molly, you're hanging out too, right? Yeah. Okay. Have you got anything live or are you going to just do some pictures or? Um, I'm clouded out, so I can't okay. do anything okay. live, but uh, I could show pictures. I'm not really sure what might be good to show. Okay. Like well, how about I'll leave you in the background. If you have something you want to show, just speak up. How about that? Okay. Okay. Sounds good. talk a little about about gear if uh like show my current backyard setup if that might be of okay. interest okay well i'll hit the three guys first and then if you have anything to say just let me know okay okay
Molly, are you thinking about going to the Texas Star Party? I am thinking about it. I went ahead and applied. Um, I'll obviously not go if depending on depending yeah. on the COVID situation, but yeah. I'm going to try and go. And I since I have my camper, um, I don't have to like use the public shower or bathroom or anything. So um, I could social distance there pretty well. Yeah. So we'll we'll see how things look. If if they have the Texas Star Party, I will likely go. Yeah. Um, just because uh, I, I can do a pretty good job of isolating while I'm there, so. Sure, you've got some beautiful images from there. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and dark skies make an incredible amount of difference. Yeah. Uh, I recently imaged the Iris Nebula from a uh, relatively dark sky site, so it's so like Bortle three and a half uh, out near Sacramento. And yeah. yeah, having dark skies just makes a world of difference. <laughs> What's your backyard? What Bortle is your backyard? Seven. It's a what? It's Bortle seven. Seven, okay. Which is not as yeah. bad as you might think for my proximity to Oakland and San Francisco, but I can actually see quite a few stars and constellations more than I expected to be able to see. Yeah. Uh, so I estimate it's about seven. Yeah. Yeah, but you've got some nice images from your backyard, really. Yeah, I'm very happy with what I've been able to get. Uh, for my wideband stuff, I just take oodles and oodles of data. And then, I, of course, now I have narrowband filters, which uh, work really well from here. Yeah. So um, I tend to have decent seeing because of my proximity to the water. So um, yeah, I've been able to get some really nice images from here. Well, why don't you plan on going through what your equipment is, like describing what your three uh, setups are and maybe what filters you're using, and then we'll do the sun We'll go in the order we just talked about and then come back and then, cause I'm kind of curious what everybody else is using too. I wouldn't yeah. mind knowing what Howard and Simon and Shailendra are using too. Um, because I think sometimes that's, we all look at pictures and we don't understand exactly what equipment is being used to get, you know, that type of image. Yeah, so. I think it makes for a good reference for people who, uh, you know, especially if you're just getting into it and you don't really know what's, what's out there yet. Yeah. Seeing what other people have kind of gives you some some like knowledge of, of what all is out there and, and what's required to to take a good image. Like what can I get away with on a right. like, budget, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it helps people too to see what your equipment will do. Maybe you can they can see something on your setup that they'll see on another setup that is a different camera or a different, you know, it just gives you an idea of what all you can maybe put together to put an image together or what you need if you have a certain time of type of image you want to do. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'll grab some example images from each of the rigs I have set up as well. Okay, that sounds good. You hanging in there, Carol? You're muted. Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> very, very interesting. It's yeah, a, oh, amazing. Uh, yeah. Shane, I, Shane I, I was amazed with his talk at Green Bank. He, I really enjoy his speaking, and everybody else has been fantastic too. Worked out very well. Yeah. Organizing all this, Terry, that you've uh, done an impeccable job on that. Thank you. Well, everybody, we are back. So, uh, hopefully, you enjoyed your your little break there. Uh, I went and made a burrito, and <laughs> Did you make ate enough of it, and I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> All Great right. Enough. I told Howard we'll go to him first, and then we are coming back to Simon, Shailendra, and then to Molly. So, okay. okay Howard, I'll, go, I'll go ahead and share the screen, and then let's see if we can get what I'm looking for. There we go. So, we learned a lot about subtle changes that can be detected by the LIGO uh, gravity wave uh, observers. So, we're going to check some subtle changes that occur from uh, solar minimum, which this was. Uh, um, around February of this year, and this is a calcium K image, and you can see there's just granulation. There's just not uh, much. Howard, we can't see an image. Oh, you can't see an image? No, all I can see is your name. Oh, my gosh. Well, let's try again. Okay. Um, I was sharing your screen there. Did there that we work? go. There we go. Okay, yeah. good. And so this is uh, solar minimum. This is as blank a sun as you will ever see just a little bit of granulation. This is in the calcium K layer. Now we'll see the, the subtle difference between that and uh, around solar maximum. Can you, everybody see the difference? <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. 
<laughs> and actually, this is a year after the solar maximum, but still there's a lot of activity on the sun. And you've got the spots, plus you've got the various magnetic fields or the plage, they call them. And uh, some are tight and compact and very active like these two. And some are kind of fading out. And then some are tired old remnants of previous spots. So that's, that's kind of an interesting thing. We're just now, seeing the, uh, the boring disk image still. Yeah, we're seeing the boring one first. Oh, are we really? I yeah. thought he was making a joke. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, probably you if you have two two separate image windows open and you're trying yeah. to switch between them uh you, you okay. probably clicked on one of them when you shared your screen and you actually oh. want to share your whole screen instead okay now this is this has gone nuts yeah so if you stop sharing and then reshare and share your whole screen instead okay. then we'll be able okay, to stop share and then start share again yeah and then uh instead of clicking on a particular window click on share whole screen share whole screen which would be where uh, probably upper left where it says like screen or screen one. Yeah, there we go. That's it. Let's go back. Uh, can you see this now? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that does look different now. Yeah, okay. definitely. Let's see the difference. On I was that. looking hard, Molly, going, <laughs> I don't know, you know. <laughs> Something's wrong with my eyes. <laughs> so here's some of the tight, compact plages that are associated with that. And up here, these are active growing spots. You've got some uh, around here. And then you've got some of the tired, older stuff down here that's leftovers. And these are, these are spots that are in the process of decay, and like down here. Um, it's also interesting to notice that uh, if you drew the solar hemisphere kind of across this line, uh, do we have more northern or more southern spots? Let's and these see. are hard to tell because they're pretty close to the equator. Yeah. But I'd, I'd put my guess on more northern spots. Yeah. And if we go to, uh, are we seeing a different picture now? Yes. Yes. Okay. This was taken two days ago. I didn't get any images yesterday because of clouds and rain. Uh, and I haven't finished processing ones from today. But this is different, obviously, than near the solar minimum. And you've got more spots going on. But there's a couple of differences. You know, here's the hemisphere. Where are all the spots now? Yeah, south. In the southern hemisphere. And you've got the uh, uh, tired old plage from a previous spot that's up here. And uh, so you see a, um, asymmetry in hemispheres. And that's very well covered in today's spaceweather.com. If you just type in spaceweather.com, they go over that and the explanation of that. And also it relates to you get a double peak in the solar cycle. Hmm. Now there's one other solar, uh, one other difference uh, that's very subtle, and, and, and this will that'll be all I'll go over. If you go through the equator here, these notice how far these are from where the equator would be, mm -hmm. and if we go back to this one from near solar uh, maximum or just within a year, they're getting close to the equator. So that's another characteristic of the solar cycle is that early at the beginning of the solar cycle. The spots tend to be at high latitudes uh, north and high latitudes south. And as the cycle progresses, they migrate towards the center. And if you were to do a scattergram graph of this, it produces kind of a butterfly pattern, which is characteristic of solar cycles. So I just wanted to share those because it's just kind of an interesting uh, uh, aspect of the solar cycle to see what's where we're headed and where we've been. That is interesting. Howard, I'm curious what equipment you are using. Um, I'm using, um, for white light, I use an Orion 70 millimeter uh, solar telescope. It basically has a built-in um, um, filter at the front of it, so there's no way you can take it apart or have it accidentally come off. And so I use that for visual observation as well as for, uh, as well as for um, um, sunspot counts. And this is a picture that I took with it the same day, two days ago. And you can see the different the sunspots with that. And it does a decent job for 70 millimeter. Uh, for the uh, calcium K, I've got a Lunt um, filter, uh, right angle filter, and then I use an 80 millimeter Orion. Um, um, it's actually the uh, Orion 80 ED. I won that in a photo contest about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, so it works really good. So I, I I just leave that filter on that. That's exclusively what I use it for. And then I have a Lunt um, 80 millimeter, well, let's see, get the full right things. It's the Lunt uh, 80 T, LS 80 THA refractor. And I, I do have it double stacked, um, which is interesting. 
but there's a close up of the double stack. Can you see that or? Yes, yeah. it looks there's nice. On that. So that's basically what I'm using and they're all mounted on one mount and it's an Orion mount and it, they come real close to meeting or exceeding the uh, limits of the mount as far as its weight's concerned. But as was discussed earlier in the imaging processing, when you're doing uh, stuff like this with very short exposures, you can get away with that. Yeah. What camera are you using? For the, uh, for the uh, close-ups, I'm just, I'm using the um, uh, Skyrus 236 monochrome, monochrome camera. Uh, and that has a higher pixel density or smaller pixels. So I can get close-up images without having to use the Barlow. Although I've got to start experimenting with using a, a small Barlow ratio to bring these Bit, but I've been pretty happy with that. And then for the uh, for the like the whole disc, I'm using a an, um, oh shoot, I can't even say the name. It's I got uh, yeah the DMK41. I've had that for eight or nine years, and it's it's still performing just terrific. Yeah, that yeah they do. They look fantastic. And then what I do for processing, I go through Auto Stacker first, and then after I go through that, I go to uh, Photoshop or not to Photoshop, but the uh, Oh, the other stack program. Let's see. It's Registax. Uh, yeah, Registax, and use the wavelets function, and then from there it all goes to um, uh, Photoshop, where I adjust adjust the um, brightness and, and image, and then colorize it, uh, sharpen it uh, very gently because it's really easy to over sharpen these things and make them look really uh, grotesque. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what I use. And there's one other filter that once in a while I'll use uh, to get the uh, like the close-ups, sometimes there's a on there, there's a filter called shake reduction. After you've done all the little things you can to try and get a good sharp image, you hit the shake reduction. And sometimes it really makes a big difference. Sometimes it introduces all kinds of artifacts and it's worthless, but it's, it's worth an experiment on there. Because yeah. it really works good. Yeah, it looks nice. Well, thank you, Howard. Uh, hang out here. We might be back. We're going to make the round and see what everybody else is doing. So thank you. That... That's some excellent shots. I enjoyed that. You're welcome. So Simon, how about you? I am still hunting around for Jupiter, although every now and then I can see birds and bugs way off in the distance showing up, which is kind of weird because I don't usually do this because um, it's actually only two o'clock in the afternoon here. And every now and then, if you look very carefully, in fact, I'm oh damn, where is it? I'm trying to chase it right now. You'll see something up in the sky that just drifts apart in the frame. Like now, there's a couple of things flapping around. Those are all birds and things like that. I don't know oh, what okay. that is. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, every now and then you'll see something flapping around. It could be bugs. It could be anything. Um, but yeah, I I'm just literally trying to find uh, Jupiter right now. Okay. But uh, there it is. No. No. <laughs> Damn it. I don't know which way it went. <laughs> okay, we can come back to you. <laughs> we'll go. We'll see if Charland, Charlandra is, is available. Hey, okay. yep. So my, um, everything's gone, actually. The, the clouds have come in. It's taken me out. So what okay. I thought I'd do is I'd share some of uh, the pictures that i taken recently. Um, the, actually, I'll show you the setup first. Here's my current setup, what I've got. It's Explore Scientific Exos 2 GT PMC8 with the Explore Scientific um, AR102 with an ASI 1600 um, cooled camera with the ZWO mini filter wheel with the 1.25 filters. And then I've got an SV Boney 50mm guide camera with the ASI 120 MCS. I've got a little mini PC that you can't really see on this image, but you should be able to see it on. That's nice. Um, but there's a mini PC there, which runs the dew heaters and the mount and everything else. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think Simon uh, collaborated a little bit on some of that equipment, right? Yep, yep. Simon sorted me out with the camera because before that I was using a DSLR. I've been doing it for about 10 months. So okay. these are some of the initial DSLR picks I got of Andromeda. Um, these were with the, um, not with that scope, but these were with a Skywatcher 102T. Mm -hmm. and then 
that was M81. This was M27 from a Bortle 4 Sky, because I'm in a Bortle 7 from the backyard, but sort of travelled away with that scope. Um, and that, you do see a lot more stars and, and so much more detail. This was the RS Nebula with about 45 minutes to an hour worth of integration with the DSLR. Um, and then when Simon got me the uh, ASI, and I started to move to pictures like these. Um, that was the SEDA region, but micro lensing has caused my star to blow out a little bit. So I haven't gone back to that one yet. Um, Elephant Trunk Nebula. Wow. A few nice. different ones on that one. Um, Flying Horse Nebula, which I did a couple of weeks ago. Wow, look at that. That's yeah. amazing. That's beautiful. And that's with the 1600 Zeta Yeah, yeah, all that kit. Um, Crescent Vail. Nebula yeah. as well. That's, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Found it. That's Tons of nebulosity. Wizard, sort of. And then the Pelican Nebula as well. Got. So I've been really lucky, actually. The last month or so, the skies have been really clear. Um, North American yeah. Nebula part of again, and the last wow. one is the Bubble Nebula. Well, you Quite know, like the colors that managed to get, and I've been using um, Nina to do all of the captures, um, using Pixasite to do the stacking and the editing. So, Those yeah, are amazing. It's, it's been a yeah, thanks. Um, I did start with free tools with. The DSLR, I started using GIMP um, and Cyril. I tried Sequator. I tried Deep Sky Stacker. To be honest, I didn't really get on with the program. Um, and then, yeah, then switching over to PixInsight and Astro Pixel Processor to start with. Um, and then I had a, a tutorial with Gary, and Gary said it's probably better if you stack it and process it in the same program so I started stacking everything in PixInsight and then using PixInsight to do all the editing and yeah it's been a big learning curve but it's, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm getting there I think <laughs> yeah yeah so you, you do you use PixInsight pretty much for everything then at this point yeah 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 all the yeah, post processes in... yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that that does have a learning curve to it doesn't it it does yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's some, there's and a, a lot, lot of it is resources. trial and error. Yeah. yeah sorry, go on, Molly. Uh, I was just going to say that there's a lot of resources online for written tutorials and video tutorials and all kinds of stuff to kind of start to figure it out. And then once you uh, learn some of the basics, you can start meshing them together to work with your images. Yeah, that's exactly what I've been doing, sort of finding things that look OK at the end and then changing the sequence and just sitting there with trial and error, trying different processes. Yeah. And it, it, yeah, I think I've got a, a half decent workflow that I can use as a basis now and then work from there. So yeah. I think you've done a great job in a short time. Those are amazing. Oh, oh cheers. Thanks, Terry. Sure. Well, let's check back with Simon and see uh, Simon. <laughs> Um, I'm going to say, oh, I can't that, confirm that, like that a this dot right there. I think that, that must be it happening. isn't. And I'll tell you why it isn't because in my field of view, I should see Saturn at the same time. Oh, with that star with that cap. I, I don't know what I'm looking at this time. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think it's a, um, what do they call it? flying saucers these days? They well, actually, in all honesty, you just missed a um, a satellite going past because um, I know what I'm looking for a lot of these times, and there was one that was going past, and I was going to follow it, but then I didn't want to lose this dot. So right now, I'm just scooting around looking for uh, Saturn to pop up into view because if I see Saturn, I know I've got Jupiter. Okay. I'll tell you what. I'll go to Molly. You keep scanning around, and we'll come back to you. Will do. Okay, Molly, tell us about what you've got, what you're using. Yeah, just a second. All right, so- uh, I want your backyard. 
<laughs> yeah, you said, so I've got a little tiny backyard uh, here in, in the Bay Area, just north of Berkeley. Uh, most people's yards are quite tiny here. Um, but it conveniently came with two cement pads. And I, I don't know how I got so lucky in that regard. <laughs> and uh, the fence completely surrounds it and is quite high. So uh, it's not visible from the road. Uh, and also the fence is high enough that blocks all my neighbor's lights. So it's actually quite dark back there, uh, at least as far as local light is concerned. Um, and my house blocks the street lights and whatnot. So. Uh, it's actually a really nice little spot to set up and I've got an outdoor power outlet and I just run everything over to there. So great. these are my three rigs. I just took this, this brand new image this morning because I just got uh, a new mount. The one in the middle is the Ioptron Sem 40. Just got that set up. It's been doing really well so far. Uh, so on the left, I have my, my, this is my main rig, my Paramount MIT that I got last November. And uh, I just had to renew my SkyX subscription, <laughs> which I hadn't done that so close to Christmas. <laughs> um, I have a Celestron 8-inch schmidt cassegrain This is my very first telescope, uh, actually, is, is that schmidt cassegrain But it's a great little imaging platform there. And I can do planets and wide and uh, deep sky with it if I would take the focal reducer on and off. Yeah. So, I put a, a Prima Lucha Lab Asado focuser on there uh, so that I can I can focus without having to move the mirror, which really helps uh, prevent mirror flop and stuff like that. I have a, uh, a, a 6.3 f 6.3 focal reducer on there. I have a ZWO ASI 1600 monochrome camera and a set of astronomic. Uh, LRGB filters. The L filter actually be, is a uh, CLS CCD, which is their uh, CCD, CCD, their, their non-DSLR basically version of a light pollution filter is the CLS CCD. Um, yeah, so that's the rig on the left. The center rig is my secondary imaging rig, which is the Ioptron Sem 40. I, ha I do have, that is a Takahashi, that is indeed a Takahashi mm. on there. <laughs> cool. The Takahashi FSQ106N. I bought that from my uncle at a uh, pretty, pretty wonderful discount. <laughs> yeah. love, love my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on there, I have a ZWO ASI294 color camera. And there is a filter wheel on there, and that's because I have a light pollution filter, the same astronomic CLS CCD, and a luminance filter, because this is one of the rigs I take with me out to the dark sky site, my, my portable rig. Uh, that way I can easily swap back and forth between the light pollution and the luminance filter, depending on how dark my skies are. Molly, how long do you leave your equipment set up at a time? Full time. Full time. Yeah. Do you see over there on the left those uh, kind of tan colored bag looking things. Yeah. <laughs> those are Telegizmos 365 covers. So I just cover it up those over top of each of my mounts and it blocks the sun, it blocks the rain. The weather here in California is pretty mild. So that's why I can leave them up all the time. It never gets below freezing here. It doesn't get super hot. Uh, we don't really have torrential rain and wind and stuff like that. So I, I can leave my gear set up with just the covers and it's pretty well protected. That's great. So yeah, I can leave it all polar aligned and aligned and not have to touch it. So basically when I, when I set up for the evening, I take my laptops outside, put them on the table there under the towel, plug everything in and hit go. And that's it. I go to bed. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> the, the rig over on the right is uh, Celestron Advanced VX, which um, uh, it's, it, that was um, one of the first mounts that I actually bought as opposed to somebody giving me one. <laughs> um, and on there, uh, currently not, I, I just swapped it over from, because uh, I had another AVX that recently broke. So I just moved that telescope over to the functioning AVX. So none of the cables are hooked up yet, but uh, that is a Vixen 8 inch F4 imaging Newtonian with a QSI 583 monochrome camera on there that was uh, graciously donated to me from a member of the AAVSO. And it has a full set of photometric filters in there that was given to me by a club member from Ohio. Nice. <laughs> um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of gear people have either uh, given to me or sold to me at a steep discount. Uh, I actually have a few other uh, semi-broken mounts inside that I'm trying to fix, and uh, another telescope or two. <laughs> <laughs> I have all kinds of stuff. But yeah, that's my backyard setup. And I, I image with all three pretty much every night because we have a lot of clear nights here. 
That's, um, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. I, I can I can confirm that this is Jupiter that we're looking at. Oh, okay. You want? How about if we go to Simon real quick, yeah. and Molly, we'll come back to you. Yeah, because I want to show some examples of some pictures I've been able to yes. take from here with these rigs. Yeah, I want to see them too, so we'll come back to you. Okay. Okay, Simon, what do you got? Okay, I can confirm this is Jupiter. I just looked oh, up yeah. the coordinates yeah, on the my hand controller. On, on the planet. <laughs> yep, you can see the bands. Um, I can't quite get Saturn to show up because it really is washed out uh, in comparison because the sun's still kind of high up by comparison. Yeah, it's like two in the afternoon. I, mean. I know, so, but this is just to prove that you can see and find planets in the middle of the daytime. That's right. Uh, that there is still a universe during the daytime. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is pretty amazing because you can see the bands. Awesome. Yes. Excellent. I'll be imaging the uh, Saturn Jupiter conjunction coming up at the end of our on the 21st uh, in before the sun sets, because that's when it's high enough for me to be able to get from from where I live. So. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it, for us, when the sun actually is um, has set, it's only five degrees above the horizon for us. Yeah. Oh, wow. That is low. I'll be able to get it when it's about 13 degrees high. Uh, and I um, I should be able to see Jupiter with my eyes at that time. Um, but uh, on the, uh, let's see, now I'm going to have to set up my other rig. Um, <laughs> yeah, it. I have to move to the other side of my yard. So I'm going to use that next star uh, Altaz mount that I have to do this and just set it up really high. And <laughs> Isn't it amazing how we can see everybody's wheels start to turn when they say, oh, yeah. oh wow, I got to move stuff. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would suggest everybody in the Northern Hemisphere to start trying to image during the daytime, you know, yeah. at least get, get Jupiter on because you can see that you can get Jupiter on in bright daylight. Um, I don't know if there's any uh, filter that might help, but... Um... No, no, I'm going to tell you now, Scott, there is absolutely no filter in the world that can help in a situation like this, because the, the real problem here is, is we're dealing with so much refraction off of our atmosphere that only the brightest objects can show up, hence why Venus is actually the easiest by far to actually be able to see. Sure. Um, I will have some words of cautions for people who do try to look for Venus, because sometimes it can be incredibly close to the sun. Oh. You yeah. have to know at all times where the sun is, and you have to kind of go out of your way to calculate the field of view that your camera and your scope actually has. Right. So you can see right now it is daytime, okay? I mean, I know it's gotten a little bit darker because we're finally in the shade, but we can actually see a planet right there and then. And I have to go down to a one millisecond exposure just to even be able to see anything. And I've tweaked the histogram as much as I can to have any of the cloud bands show up. And this is only a hundred millimeter scope, don't forget. This is a mm -hmm. small scope, relatively. Mm -hmm. So, And the fact that I'm actually tracking can confirm that this is actually Jupiter as well. Right. It's great. That is, it's amazing. It's great. Thank you. And we'll come back and see what you're doing, Simon, if you Find yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll stay around and I'm going to try and find Saturn at the same time. I'll let okay. you know. Sounds good. Molly, we'll go back to you and you can show some images from the different setups. Cool. Simon, you were using a ZWO camera? Uh, yes, it's actually the same camera I was using to do uh, the solar imaging. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I, I really like my, uh, my ZWO 1600. It's probably my favorite camera. Uh, and I've got the T94 as well, and we'll see what else I get in the future. Um, uh, what? Oh, nothing. I'll, I'll ask later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, this one I did capture from my backyard here in my Bortle 7 skies of uh, just northeast of San Francisco. Uh, this this largely looks as good as it does because I have a set of, of I have a chroma oxygen three filter and a chroma hydrogen alpha filter on that eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain, and um, actually sorry, um, I was sidetracked by something. Um, so I can I can get so much more detail because they're piercing through the light pollution of the city because they're, they're only three nanometers wide the the band gap on those two narrow band filters. So it pierces through all the light pollution and gets me an image like I would be able to get at a dark sky site. 
Um, and for nebula that have a lot of oxygen and hydrogen signal, you can get an image that looks like it's natural colors. This, of course, doesn't work on galaxies and whatnot, uh, although I can enhance a galaxy image that with hydrogen alpha, if it has hydrogen alpha regions in it, like a lot of galaxies do. Yeah, so this and is through the eight inch McCassidy. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. That's nice. That is real nice from your own backyard. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, I was very happy when I started getting the O3 images in that got the, the extended halo around yeah. the dumbbell. Beautiful. I was ecstatic and was so excited to start to stack these. It's beautiful. Oh, uh, the amount of data I got on this was, um, I'll pull this over here. Uh, it's a total of 22, almost 23 hours of data. Uh, most of that is is the hydrogen and the oxygen and then about an hour and a half each of luminance red green and blue to get the the star field that's nice thank you uh this one's not from my backyard this one i drove out to a relatively dark sky site up northeast of sacramento and um this is in it's in like bordel three and a half skies and this is with the takahashi and the color camera, the uh, the 294, ZWO 294. And this is definitely my, hands down, my best image of the Iris Nebula because I was able to get so much of the dark nebula and finally kind of get some of that brown color out of the dark nebula that's really hard to get from the light polluted areas. So I was very happy with this. And this is not from my backyard, but <laughs> with that gear. <laughs> that's nice too. Thank you. I really like the dark nebulas. Me too. They're one of my favorite. Yeah, me too. Uh, this is too. Uh, five hours of exposure time total, 64 by five minute yeah. images. It's amazing. You know, the dark nebula makes makes looking at, at you know, these two dimensional uh, photographs look, it makes it look 3D. It really yeah, does. Yeah, it does. I agree. Yeah. yeah, you can- It gives depth it. to it. You know, you just think that, oh, wow, I'm looking, through something instead of just like this, this flat plane, you know? Yeah, you, know? So you, you can see kind of how, you can see exactly how the dust clouds obscured the stars behind them when you can see kind of see some stars through some of the thinner portions and the no stars through the thicker portions. Yeah. Uh, and then it, it lends some depth to the reflection nebula portion yes. the center here as well. And it really just really does. makes it feel 3D. Yeah, yeah that's beautiful. <clears throat> Thank you. This one was taken from my backyard. This is an example of, of not using narrowband imaging in the light polluted areas. This is Messier 88, uh, a galaxy. Um, let's see, I didn't write down. I can't remember offhand where this is at, but somewhere southish because a lot of my north sky is, is blocked um, by my house and trees. Uh, but this is with my eight inch McCassegrain with uh, the light pollution filter for luminance and then red, green, and blue filters. And this is a total of, let's see, um, this is a total of a, a, just about eight hours of data. So um, uh, two, a little less than three hours on luminance, two and a half on red, one and a half on green, and one and a half on blue. Uh, so not not a ton of data. I mean, more than I was able to take. Like when I before I had a permanent backyard setup, I would try to do one target in a, in a single night because it was so difficult to set up and tear down. So I would get maybe three, maybe four hours on it if I was really patient, which I, when I first started astrophotography, I had no patience whatsoever. <laughs> um, but now I can sit on a target for, for a few months at a time. This image I took uh, over the span of March 31st to June 12th. I just sat on it and I, I, I took, you know, an hour and a half, two hours a night when it was up in the higher part of the sky where there's less light pollution and, and less mm. muck of the atmosphere. And mm. by being patient, I was able to get a good good quality eight hours of data on it. I, I took a lot more than that, but deleted all the frames that weren't as weren't as good. So my stars look nice. You can got I got a lot of detail on the galaxy core. Um, the color is um, I wish the color was a little better on it, but uh, using a light pollution filter makes getting really good color on galaxies a challenge. So I'll probably go back and reprocess this one at some point. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, so this one was kind of a, an experiment that I was doing. Um, I, I I took the Takahashi off of off of the, at the time I had it on my <clears throat> Celestron AVX 
and I put on a camera lens with my uh, ZWO color camera instead. Um, I think I've got a picture of that. Um, yeah, here. Um, so this this is the rig that I used where I, I used a relatively cheap Nikon 55 to 200 millimeter kit lens that came with my with my Nikon D3100 back in the day. Um, and uh, the filter wheel is acts as partly spacer, partly uh, a convenient way to put a filter in without having to buy more equipment than I already had. <laughs> yeah. um, this is the North American Nebula, and this is from my backyard. So uh, oh, wow. this is a big difference with using a, a Astro camera as opposed to a DSLR, is that you get so much more red signal because mm -hmm. you're not, uh, the, the DS, DSLRs that are not Astro modified block part of the red spectrum Partly their infrared filter overlaps it, and partly because they're designed so that when you take a picture, the colors look just like they do to your eyes. And the human eye is not very sensitive to red, which is why we use red lights when we're out on the observing field. Uh, but the Astro color cameras don't have the spectrum filter on there, so you can get much better red signal and then properly balance the colors in post processing using, uh, I use photometric color calibration in Pix and Sight, it's my favorite my favorite tool and worth every penny of pics and sight, honestly. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, star color, uh, I've had a lot of trouble getting good star color from here, but I, I was able to get some some reasonable uh, shot of the uh, North American Nebula from my backyard here, so. Yeah, that is nice. I like that. That looks, I love it. Those Beautiful. are just some uh, selected ones. The, 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 the variable star rig, there's not really any images that are worth showing. Um, and I don't have enough data to make a nice, a nice uh, light curve yet because I just got started doing that back in June and I've had interruptions when the various mounts have died that that telescope was on. So <laughs> at some point, maybe maybe this time next year, I'll have a nice complete light curve to show, show on some star. And we need to get Barb Harris on here to yes. show uh, her light curve. She's amazing. Yeah, and she uses a DSLR. She she uses yeah. a, a DSLR and I think either a camera lens or a telescope, mm -hmm. I can't remember, but you know, she doesn't use photometric filters and mm -hmm. she submits a lot of good quality data to the AAVSO and is one of their most prolific observers. So yeah, she's uh, amazing. She's yeah. she does excellent stuff. Yeah. We'll have to get her. Yeah. So Simon, how are you doing? Uh I, I can't see um I can't see Saturn at all, but it's it kind of I, I know where it is and where it should be. Um, it there should it be is. somewhere here. No. I see something. Oh, there is a little something. There right it here. is. No, that's mo that oh, something's okay, moving. Yeah, that, that looks like a, it's moving. Like <laughs> no, I'm I'm going to tell you now. A lot of these little no, it's random Saturn's moving across the field. Look, I <laughs> know uh, a lot of these random white dots. Okay, I can actually tell you right now. The chances are is is probably just some random Earthbound satellite that is just whizzing past, because mm -hmm. I'm actually facing in the right direction where a lot of these earthbound satellites are, you know, um, and things like that, that always show up in this vicinity. Um, it's fun to watch them. Um, I have seen um, uh, one of the rocket parts that have been up there since like 1960s. I looked it up, found the SO number or whatever right. the number is, went to it and lo and behold, there it was. And as it spins round, because it's actually, um, it's actually spinning around like this, you'll see a dot and then it gets longer and then it gets shorter again. So you can see it's rotating constantly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I love seeing those. It, cause I, get, I get those passing through my deep sky subframes all the time. And you can tell which ones are spinning rocket bodies and stuff because of that exact effect. You can yeah. see it in the images, it's really cool. I'm gonna have to clean that up one day, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, companies who are working that. on uh, <laughs> making like space claws to go out and like grab stuff and like shoot it back at the earth to burn up in the atmosphere <laughs> or whatever they're going to do you know space. I like the idea of space claws I mean if I could see where the moons any of the moons right now on on uh, Jupiter it would actually make my life so much easier to actually find Saturn because um Right now, where the moons are positioned is they will paint a long line to the direction of where it actually is. Um, you can see moons of Jupiter, you could certainly see Saturn because I think that they're dimmer than Saturn, right? Oh, they're way, yeah, they're way dimmer, but I'm not even getting any evidence of a moon out there right now. And I should see at least one of them, but there's nothing. So it's it's a bit of a about, struggle. 
Oh, wait a minute. How about the banding? You were getting that. So the banding, this is why I'm going um, up and down, not left and right. So yeah. I should see Saturn in and amongst here somewhere. And it's actually from the, uh, the field of view of the scope. It should be close by. So this is what I should actually see roughly. So if I zoom in slightly, you'll okay. see that as the moons show up, they kind of point to where Saturn actually is. But I, I just need to see one moon, and I'll know which way to go, and I'll find it. But bearing in mind, I've, I'm going by nothing here. There's no stars to look at. There's no... There's just this. Saturn's like half a degree away, something like that right now. So right now, full screen, I have more than half a degree. I have almost three degrees worth of uh, view here. Yeah. Three or four, at least. So saturn's there <laughs> it's just lost in the glare at that moment yeah it's like i don't it's even a, it's like a degree like a degree and three quarters like a degree is and it? 42 arc minutes yeah yeah so what's that um geez that's less than the moon no no it's degrees degree. so about, oh so, so a degree and 42 minutes so it's actually a little more than three times the width of the moon yeah three times the width of the moon come with me all right, so let's hope that we don't lose this. So I'm going to keep going until we find a bright spot show up. What if we see these giant rings come into the field of view? Well, that's a whole different story because then we know for sure. <laughs> what if we see a square, a cube drift in? <laughs> well, that would be the Borg. Green lasers. <laughs> you know, like oh, in 2001? Yeah. Yep. No, I was thinking the Borg. The but... Oh, the Borg, those guys, yeah. Or, or, or the board. Uh, what if we saw something that looked like a? It's usually my audience, you know, the board. <laughs> yeah, I've got the cam. I've got the camera turned up quite a fair bit now. So if it's here, it Saturn would. Have... Is, I, I give lectures for sleep therapy for my audience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an expert in the field. I'm just going to go a little quicker just to see if we can whiz past anything. See, so that's Jupiter going past. I would have yeah. seen it by now. So uh, Saturn is currently magnitude plus 0 0.6. You should be uh, able to get we that. We should be able to see it. Yeah, yeah, we should. And Jupiter is, well, Jupiter is currently uh, negative 2. Um, right. I've got that so... confirmed too. Negative 2. And that's, yeah, I should see it. There should be yeah. no reason why I shouldn't see it. To see the moons because those are like magnitude five and six. Um, so now, I uh, when you when you have it so you can see the bands, um, they'll at least tell you which like yeah, up and that's right. That's plain. Go, but you'd have to go look in both. Um, um, yeah, well, yeah, that's that's plan. what I was trying to do. So let's yeah. let's see if we, we're determined now before the program finishes, aren't we? <laughs> like everyone at home you is like, have going, to show it. Saturn. <laughs> yeah, and if you just follow, well, uh, it's not just like directly along RA or deck either. So you have to kind of zigzag to get there. <laughs> oh, I've got such a wide field of view right now. I should get it coming view? in. Um, this is a 550 millimeter telescope. Um, so it's like, uh, let's see, what camera do you have on there? It's the 174. My field of view actually is. So it should be like like a degree, a little over a degree, right? Yeah, that's what I should. Oh, that's the 150. That's what I should have. That red square shows me what I should be able to see. Oh, uh, yeah. Seems a little too big because, well, maybe. So Jupiter, so Saturn is is a degree and forty four minutes from Saturn. Hmm. Let me. It, it wants your scope. How how good's the go to on your scope? Uh, right now it's actually very badly set up. Okay. So if I if, if you, I do if you sync it to Jupiter, Saturn is close enough that it it might be able to land it in the middle. It's true. Let's yeah. see if I can. So now here's here's the problem. This is where I don't know the hand controller for a Skywatcher mount, and uh, I hate to admit this on air and, and put myself in a bad position because I should actually know how to use this, but I don't. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't have a Skywatcher. I haven't used one myself, so I'm not sure where the function is. If, if, if there's like wherever you have your alignment tools, there's probably a sync 
function in where your alignment stuff is at. Uh, that's what I'm looking for right now. Function. Yeah, I'll look it up online too. Okay. I have an excuse. I don't work for Skywatcher, so. <laughs> Luckily for me, I don't either right now. If you're connected oh, to the scope to Stellarium, you can just press Control One, and it will. Um, yes. Yeah, but if his pointing model isn't very good, then it's not going to get there accurately. But if he's if he if he can sync on Jupiter in the hand controller, then he can use Stellarium or the hand controller to say go to Saturn, and it should yeah, it should be it should pop Perfect. it right in the middle because Saturn is so close to Jupiter right now. Oh. Uh, I don't have the manual. alignment. Yeah, I was gonna, I'm going to go look this up and see. Well, the thing is, though, I did bypass the alignment procedure. You know what? Let me go get a USB cable to plug into the mount because I can't force this. Give me two seconds. I'll be okay. right back. Okay. Now, Landra, have you got anything you would like to show us? Uh, no, that, that was... Be done. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that was yeah, definitely good enough. Beautiful. Okay, we'll just if you have anything you want to jump in on, just let us know. Yeah, yeah, no, we'll do it. Cheers. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Performing a normal sync. After you perform go to to any object, the object may not be centered. Uh, Therefore, after a go to, the app will prompt you to use the direction bu buttons to make the object fully centered. This centering procedure is sync. Uh, so I know, like, like in Carts Do CL, you can sync. You can hit the sync button, and it will send the sync command. Oh, that's that's true. Now, that's I don't true. know if Stellarium has that command. I've never used Stellarium for mount control. Uh, nice so thing. let me Google here real quick. See Stellarium sync. Yeah, so we're not worried about the Skywatcher system. We're worried about well, it, it, the either app that it's connected to. There's two ways we can do it, uh, either through the software or through the hand controller. Um, oh, you can you can right click on your target and hit sync scope. There you go. In in Stellarium, according Easy. to Cloudy Nights. Easy peasy. <laughs> All right, give me two seconds. Let's see where Stellarium thinks it's pointing real quick. So I just got to wait for it to load up. Okay. Yeah. So so um, oh, we're drifting. Oh no. Well, yeah. So so when it when it connects to the mount, I uh, on some of my mounts, it'll it'll start, it'll stop tracking while the connection process is happening. But uh, yeah. So in in if you get Jupiter centered and then in Stellarium, right click on Jupiter and hit. Oh, it's not then, far. Yeah, it's really close. Okay. Yeah, so, so go to Jupiter, right click and, and hit sync and let's see if it works. Uh control three, I think it is. Yep, it is control three. Okay, so okay, okay. <laughs> let's see uh, if it will go to it. We need to hear evil laughter if it comes into the field of view. <laughs> All right. So now we have to find the exposure. Uh let me just reset the camera so it gives me a new curve. There it is. Ah. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> See? We knew you could do it. Yay. There it is. Woo. Oh, you can see the ears. I'll kill it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Zoom in on the split between the rings. Yeah, zoom in on the split between the rings. <laughs> He's using a 550 millimeter focal length telescope. <laughs> You're lucky that you can see that it's elongated. <laughs> I, know. I know. It's awesome. It's awesome. So yes, how far away was it? Can you can you now back out and see both uh, objects in the field of view at the same time? Um, no. So they're not in the same field of view. Ah, huh. that's what was messing you up. Ooh. Yeah. I know this is probably for people looking at home, going, "I don't see a damn thing," but <laughs> trust us. It comes through okay on over the Zoom connection. Uh, <laughs> we saw it. Didn't hold we? on, yeah, hold on, hold on. Um, right, Molly, there it is. Right? <laughs> see, there it is. Yep, there it is. Yeah, there you go. Okay, let's see if we can try and get an exposure for it now. Oh, yeah. Look at that, folks. That's Saturn. Yeah, seeing just kind of as dipped, that's why we have that rippling right now. Yeah. 
I guess so your, your field of view um, is only 1.2 degrees by 0.7 degrees. Um, and ah, so it's just Saturn, out. Yeah, so Jupiter and Saturn are like one point, uh, let's see, 1.8 degrees apart. Um, so it was outside your field of view. Damn. I should have gotten a bigger camera set up on this. Yeah, that 174 has a pretty small chip, it looks like. Oh, it's tiny. Yeah. So then hopefully we can, let's see if I can get both things on the screen at the same time. And for the audience's information, I was using astronomy.tools slash field of view calculator to calculate that field of view. See the That's the disclaimer. <laughs> oh, no, this is just for your information because I could, you know, you'd be like, well, how'd you calculate that? I want to know for my own system. Yeah, she, she did that in her head. She did. Oh, not that cool. Yeah. <laughs> now that I have enough telescope setups, I can kind of take an estimate at like, okay, if the chip is like this size and the focal length is this size, and then you're going to have a field of view of about this. Uh, just because I've used so many different combinations now, uh, but yeah, I, I for, do like I do like your Zoom background because it's making you you know they say that people are you know we're made from stardust and you actually do have stars just in your right shoulder though, so, <laughs> yeah, so know, it hasn't overtaken you yet. <laughs> I noticed the cat has a region here. Oh yeah, that's that beautiful shot. That's true. Oh, my Unfortunately, none of it. This was a borrowed Sony, a borrowed Rokinon 135 millimeter f2 lens. But this is only a half hour exposure. This is like this is a set of, of 30 second exposures. So a that camera is awesome. B the lens is awesome, and C dark skies are they are awesome. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Combination. It's hard to beat. Oh yeah, yeah. So I'm saving up for one of those lenses, uh, yeah. and I'm gonna pair it with with my ZWO cameras or whatever other cameras I get in the future. And yeah. yeah. Could be awesome. Yeah. I would have got that lens already, except I had to buy a new mount when my Celestron CX <laughs> died after my Celestron CGE Pro died after my Celestron CGE died. Now, you can buy yourself a Christmas present. It's not that far away. Yeah. Well, that was the, the new mount was my Christmas present, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have any money left. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that too. <laughs> Astronomy does that too. It seems strange to me. I mean, we only have like, um, I mean, a little over two weeks before these planets are supposed to be what six arc minutes apart. Yes. Yeah. From from a, a degree and whatever it is, a degree and change. Okay, uh, to six arc minutes apart. So probably starting now, everybody should watch watch those planets every night that they can, because we're going to see something that's remarkable and have hasn't been seen in what, over three hundred years. So. Yeah, they just come right up on each other, looking at, at Sky Safari, and yeah, it's, it's going to be awesome. I, I, I'm actually going to be able to fit the two of them in the field of view of my 8-inch Schmidt Cassegrain without the focal reducer and possibly with a Barlow. So I'm going to get so much detail on the two of them in the same field of view. I'm so excited. <laughs> right. You know what would be a really interesting thing here, and again, this is all perspective, I guess. If if you can imagine that, probably in another three, four hundred years' time, when this happens again, that um, Jupiter will actually go behind. Sorry, Saturn will go behind Jupiter, and pop out on the other side. That would be the strangest thing ever to watch. So cool. <sighs> Oh, man. I mean, <laughs> I mean theoretically, I know, I'm right. Why can't we be in the right place? But I mean, theoretically, it's, well, it's not theoretically. It, it can be possible. You just have to find that exact line of where everything intersects. And it'll be probably one of the best shots you've ever seen because you'll see Saturn with two little ears stick out and then it pops out on the other side. That'd be something else. Yeah, I, I was sad enough to miss uh, uh, the moon occulting Saturn because you could only see it from like the southern hemisphere or like the other side of the world, something like that. It wasn't visible here. I was very sad. <laughs> I think. Um, wait, wasn't Mars um, visible with this with the moon at one point here? I, I can't remember. I think I, know, I think they were close, but I don't I don't think from the U.S. we were able to get an actual occultation. I mean, I've seen um, at least not 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 in the last time around. I mean, this guy must was just dead lucky that he caught this in California, I think it was, but probably Northern California was when the ISS went in front of oh. uh, Mars. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. We we had uh, we had him on uh, the Astro Imaging Channel, um, or he is going to be on the he's going to be on the Astro Imaging Channel here coming up. Tom Tom Glenn, I think his name was. Right. And the yeah. funny thing here is, is a shot like that did pop up um, a few years back, which was faked, oh. um, which caused quite quite the stir from from everybody because i think he got caught with his pants around his ankles essentially when somebody asked him something and essentially he gave the wrong answer which Oops. basically said okay this is a fake image oh, no. hey molly yeah. Uh, yeah. i have a question for you do you um i know that there are some people out there that uh, offer tutoring do you do you offer that do you offer that service yet um I mean, I haven't really done it formally, I guess. Um, I'm kind of like, there's some people I replied to via email. I did sit down and have, have a, a video chat session that I was paid for, uh, for helping uh, a guy set up his, his new mount and um, get sequence yeah. programmed and stuff. But um, I haven't really figured out how exactly, how I want to handle that exactly yet. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, there are people that, uh, you know, they, they, they want to learn more um uh about all this uh i know people like yourself um gary palmer's another one of them you know you've got hundreds or thousands of hours into learning programs and how to do astrophotography and um, people would like to take a little bit more of a shortcut instead of spending all that time <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, right we they would like, set up and like to get into the and all of this stuff was up and running i uh, where you know if, if like like when i was trying to figure this out initially without such like one-on-one -on -one help you know that's, that's a several months long process <laughs> yes it yeah. is it, it is, is definitely yeah uh, i do have i do have a blog uh at astronomali.com where i write about how like my my pics and site workflow and stuff like that. Although I will admit I've not updated it recently. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm working on it. I just, I'm, you know, PhD makes one quite busy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I do try yeah. to write these things down. I'm eventually going to make some videos. Uh, but again, it's also pretty time consuming. So uh, yeah. that way people can have them as, as references and stuff. But uh, so those are upcoming plans. Um, but I do, I do dish out a lot of advice when people ask me questions and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we've seen such a growth in astronomy. I mean, so many people have bought equipment, bought cameras, you know, and, and there is a learning curve out there that everybody, you know, goes through for this. And, uh, you know, speaking from firsthand experience, I appreciate all the help I can get. <laughs> so, and you do want to save time because it does take a while when you're starting out. So, well, you, th you think about how valuable your personal time is, you know. Yes. Definitely. And, uh, so while we do most of what we do in amateur astronomy for free, you know, and it's certainly many amateur astronomers and astrophotographers are freely give out, you know, information uh, to have someone really walk you through it until you've got it. OK, yeah. uh, that 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 should that should probably be, um, you know, something that you should be willing to, willing to invest in because you're just investing into yourself. And that's probably how I'm going to do it because, like, I, I I came into this wanting to do like wanting to share as much information as I learned. That's how I kind of live like my whole life. Um, so I'm happy to dish out tidbits here and there, um, but to like sit down and, and go through like a whole uh, a whole workflow or a whole like configuration stuff. Um, yeah. Is a, is a lot more effort. Um, oh yeah. So I don't know. We'll, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, to so give that some thought. So are we at a point where uh, we need to wrap this up pretty soon here? Um, does anybody else have anything? I mean, Simon, I know you are working away, but does anybody else have anything else they'd like to add? Yeah. All right. Uh, well, let's just go ahead and Simon, unless you have anything there that you would like to finish up with um actually probably yes let's okay. as, a, as a quick thing just to show everybody so hopefully you'll see this on my screen because again i don't do screen sharing i could just you know flick and say hey and then flick <laughs> back <laughs> yeah. so what i'm going to show you here is something that happens obviously from the um, the solar flare that happened uh, a while back is coronal loops 
which oh, is wow. super rare. And now, if you're looking carefully, this is actually an animation. This is not a still video. Oh, look at that. That is so cool. Beautiful. And again, this is one of these rare moments that happen, I don't know, once every blue moon. Well, more than that. I mean, the last time I ever saw a coronal loop was, oh boy, I think it was just after the eclipse. It was in 2017. Yeah. And it was a double coronal loop, which was even more weird. Mm. What's that the, is amazing. What's like the the frame rate on that? Is that like every five minutes, ten minutes, or faster? No, this okay. So I shoot for every thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Okay. So every thirty seconds, I take um say a thousand grabs, right. and that's what I use to stitch it together. That's what makes these animations look so incredibly smooth. And I'll give you another example of one real quick. And this one was actually quite a good one because um, you can actually see. It's oh. swirling around. Wow. Wow. It's like a tornado. Wow. I want it a is like a tornado. So bad. <laughs> now you gotta remember this is like these are 30 seconds apart. And when people say to you that I saw something move, I tend to believe them because Oh yeah. 30 yeah. seconds and this amount of movement. Yeah, you could was, see that move in real time. Yeah, it yeah. was just crazy. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Now um I'm gonna do a shameless plug here. Because uh, if anybody's noticed, my username is Simon2940, and my post number is up to 2,948. On my 2,940th post that I did, I decided to do a giveaway where you could win this planetary camera. It's open oh, wow. to anybody on this planet. Um, all you got to do is just find me on Instagram and just follow the rules. The winner will be announced on the 7th. So... Wow. You've only got two days left to enter in, and there's like 270 something plus people that so have already entered. This is on entered. Instagram. And how did they find you? So it's Simon2940, and that's on Instagram. So it's Instagram.com slash Simon2940 is the way that I say it. And to celebrate my 200, uh, sorry, 2940th post, I was going to, I'm giving away a ASI 462 MC color planetary camera. Um, again, you don't have to be a member of anything, and I don't need to like my own image. You don't have to be a member of anything. You don't even have to follow me. You don't even have to like. All you got to do is just follow the rules that it says on there. And as long as you're on the planet Earth, I will get it to you. I would recommend that you also like him. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, a, it makes He's a nice a, guy. <laughs> well, this isn't about likes. That was the big thing because, you know, people give away things, you know, oh, I've reached 10,000 followers. Like, you know? What's not to like? <laughs> so, yeah, that's why I decided to do it based upon the amount of posts that I've done. Um, plus, you get to see all of the stuff that I've been doing. Like this image was taken this morning, which is when I was mentioning there was a solar flare uh, coming from um what was it 2790 and that's the actual designation that we give those and unfortunately the drive i've just pulled out and removed to see if i can recover it later but this is the only frame i have now <laughs> oh well wow. yes <laughs> and of course there's jupiter hiding behind this horrible pile of bad seeing <laughs> bad. but we know it's there we know it's there yeah, that's the important part. We know it's there. Yep. All right. Thank you all for being here, Scott. Thank you for broadcasting this. Thank you, Terry. Thank Greatly you. appreciate it. Our pleasure. It was a lot well, of fun. Thank you, Simon Molly's Shailindra. Thank you. Uh, it's, I really Jane am Larson. No, everybody. You know, David. Yeah, Levy. everybody did such a great job. I mean, it's all been interesting and fun. All the so people. So thank you all so much. Yep. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. And we'll it's catch been a you pleasure. Next time. Okay. Thanks. All right. Here we go. Okay. Bye bye. Bye guys. Bye. Bye bye.
Oh, what happened to the pirate ship logo? I don't know.